Oh, hey there. Didn't see you come in. I mean, I can't see any of you. This is a podcast. The only way I know any of you exists is if you leave feedback. So, you know, do that. I... The validation sustains me? Anyways, welcome to uh, episode 160 of Random Encounter. I'm Greg Dalmich, the host for this episode. And before we get into it, we've got a few things to chat about that have been going on the website over the past couple weeks. First of all, over in the features department, we have Tina Ola's continuing bi-weekly feature, Crowdfunding Chronicles. She's gotten up volume 7 and 8, and has revealed a lot of great hits on Indiegogo and Kickstarter, some of which have been funded, some that have fallen short, sadly. And yeah, the future ones that are looking very promising, so definitely check that out. With Final Fantasy XIV's next installment, Shadowbringers on the Horizon, on July 7th, Derek Heemsbergen has put together a really nice and light uh, speculative piece called Encyclopedic Observations, Final Fantasy XIV and the Future of Eorzea in Shadowbringers. He looks back on a lot of the history that precedes the expansion and goes into, like I said, speculating on what might happen in the expansion to come. The final big feature that's come out is from Kyle Seeley in the wake of all the Kingdom Hearts hype. The Real Worlds of Kingdom Hearts, A Travel Guide for History Buffs, Part 1, is an in-depth look at all the worlds from the first entry in the Kingdom Hearts series and the historical ties that the worlds from Kingdom Hearts have to our real world cultures and histories. A really interesting article and I definitely recommend people check it out. And over in the reviews department we've had a few developments to talk about. First of all, Tris Mendoza has given editor's choice to East Shade, which is a beautiful looking adventure game. Nathan Lee talked about Death and Request, a nice traditional RPG on the last episode of Random Encounter, so if you want to hear more of his in-depth thoughts, please check out the review. On this episode, Caitlin Argyros goes into more discussion on Anthem, which she just dropped a review for as well. So if you want to read more about Bioware's latest action RPG, check that out as well. And finally, as of this recording, yesterday was Mario Day. So it only seems appropriate that we dropped Jonathan Logan's review of Mario & Luigi, Bowser's Inside Story plus Bowser Jr. Story. The traditional DS RPG remade for the 3DS. And finally, you know we've got some soundtrack reviews for your sweet ears. Patrick Gann, as always, is very busy listening to music and has dropped two reviews for us this week. Sino Alice's OST was reviewed by him and has uh, a nice collection of some softer stuff from what I've heard and a few uh, more rocking kind of choral pieces. It's a really interesting soundtrack to take in. The other one is Corpse Party Blood Covered Sound Collection Volume 1, which is full of a lot of spooky atmosphere kind of stuff. So if either of those are interesting to you, go check out the reviews and see if you want to pick up those soundtracks for yourself. And that brings us to the start of yet another episode of Random Encounter. Hello folks, welcome back to another episode of RPG Fans Random Encounter. I am your host today, Greg Dalmage. You can find me at Greg Dalmage pretty much anywhere on the web. And I am joined by Kaylin Argyros. Hey guys, Lane Cazarel pretty much everywhere as well. And uh, the uh, podcaster blaster, I don't know, uh, <laughs> I'm making a really stupid Thunderdome reference. Uh, but Mike Solosi is here as well. Hi, this is Mike Solosi, the Podfather. You made me an offer I could not refuse, and I agreed to appear on your fine podcast. I will uh, kiss the ring. No. All right. Thank you. It is not the day of my daughter's wedding, but it's much appreciated. Um, I am Mike Solosi. I am at the Real Monsoon on Twitter, and some variation of Monsoon or Monsoon Mike most places on the internet. <laughs> and uh, I feel like that's like uh, an intro of the year <laughs> candidate. If you decide ultimately to cut it, I will not be offended. <laughs> <laughs> I really enjoyed it. Uh, and then later on, we're also going to be joined by a special guest, but we'll introduce them uh, once we get them on board. So, hey, everybody. Uh, it's been a couple weeks since we all chatted about stuff. Almost a month now since we've had Mike on here. What have you two been up to uh, that's, you know, not necessarily RPG fan related? Is there is there anything that's not RPG fan related? Like, <laughs> most of, a lot of what I do is... 
actually ending up related to the site. Like, if I'm not doing stuff for the site, I'm playing RPGs, so it's like... <laughs> it's kind of where my most of my gaming goes to, is into the RPG realm, which kind of made coming to the site a match made in heaven. And Mike, how about yourself? Have you been uh, mostly playing the RPGs, or what else have you been up to? Uh, a lot of RPGs. Uh, if it's not related to work or RPG fan or video games, I'm probably, I don't know, uh, either exercising or trying to pet someone's dog valid pastimes oh, speaking of which tangent but oh. are you aware of the twitter account that's all about mm -hmm. the dogs you can pet in video games and the dogs yes. you can't about 30 percent of the reason dragon quest 11 was my game of the year last year was because you can pet the dogs and play with the cats <laughs> and i believe that's come up on this cast but, it has uh, i'm fact sure that you it has can, well that yes but also that you can't pet the dogs in breath of the wild yes Stuff with that. which is which is very frustrating there are many good dogs in breath of the wild and you can't pet any of them and it's tragic i'm side eyeing every game that has dogs you can't pet like why you know um in tales of symphonia i don't think you can pet the dogs but it is a side quest to meet every dog in the game and have colette name them so i'm, I'm gonna allow that as a substitute it's a very cute side quest and we'll see if we can pet robo dogs in um whatever ah, what was that one that nintendo just told us about a couple weeks back uh, Astral Chain? In Astral Chain, yeah. I wonder if you can pet your robo dogs. I mean, dogs you can not. ride your robo dogs, so hopefully you can pet them, but. When you said robo dog, <laughs> I briefly thought of Secret of Evermore, but I knew that wasn't the right answer. I was thinking Cyberpunk. But that's a good answer. I wonder if. Have we, have we seen robo dogs? I don't that? remember seeing animals in that demo they showed. Yeah, neither do I. Although, speaking of robo dogs, I did just see uh, Alita Battle Angel, and there's some very good robo boys in that one. How how distracting were her eyes? Weirdly, at first, it did catch you off guard, but you come to accept it, I find, pretty easily, because they I had mentioned as much when we uh, talked to anybody about it, really, and I, I think talked about it in the Slack, that it's a visually incredibly pleasing movie, and yeah, her interesting design doesn't really distract from that for very long, because it's just, it's really well done, and fairly seamlessly integrated into everything but where the film suffers is just in its storytelling and not very believable mm -hmm. dialogue but uh, it i didn't find it took me out all that much so you're, you were able to leap across the uncanny valley without much of a struggle exactly it's amazing where we're getting to now that uh yeah years ago jeff bridges as clue was hard to accept and the uncanny valley is definitely still there but it's getting eerily close now why don't you there was something you were playing, Mike, that wasn't an RPG, wasn't it? Oh, there? yeah. Um, yeah, we're recording this over the weekend, and uh, Devil May Cry came out a day or two ago, depending on when this episode releases. And uh, I, I think that game is 20 missions, and I'm on mission 9, so I'm around halfway through, and I adore this thing. I really liked a few of the previous Devil May Cry games, not all of them, because everyone knows DMC2 is terrible, but this one seems like as good or better than the best of old Devil May Cry, so I'm having an absolute blast with it. But there is no RPG elements in this thing at all, so we should probably just stop talking about it before I get too deep into a DMC hole. <laughs> That's fair. We should uh, rein things in as necessary so we can get on to other good RPGs or otherwise questionable RPGs, which I believe is what we're going to turn over to Caitlin to kick off the discussion with today. Anthem finally came out in its uh, final form. However, at whatever point you were able to play it based on your uh, access through, uh, what was it, EA Origins? Or what was the other two points of access you could well, you just get it like everybody else on day of release? And there was one other EA one. access on Xbox and then Origin access basic and premiere on PC. Exactly. So whenever you got to play it, you've already been getting into it. And it's been definitely struggling, I guess, is a gentle way to put it. But I'll let Caitlin get into that since she just dropped a review for us. Yes, I did. So I really wanted to like Anthem, um, largely because, of course, Bioware, huge Bioware fan wanted to see what they would do with this i was curious to see how they would try to out destiny destiny once it became apparent that they were going for the kind of destiny experience because my biggest hang up with destiny was and still is the, the story and the characters and i thought well if anybody can do that right it would be bioware are they destined to out destiny destiny sadly based on what they've provided thus far no they are not. So the real question, though, do we call it a loot RPG, a shooter RPG, or the terrible uh, portmanteau schluter? I call it a looter shooter in my review. Okay, looter shooter. All right. I like that better. Yeah. Makes me less want to vomit. Oh, yeah. I, I, I did not invent that term, and I am regretting ever reading it. So Anthem is 
set in a mysterious world where these godlike beings called shapers created everything. They have mysterious technology that allows them to utilize a powerful but also mysterious force called the Anthem of Creation, which can basically warp reality to like create anything out of nothing or change existing reality as it sees fit so like it could in one localized spot it could spawn a bunch of monsters or it could completely change the biome of a region or whatnot and somehow the shapers were able to use their technology to harness that power to create the world but then they disappeared mysteriously leaving behind their technology and their ruins and sometimes that tech because it's not being used by these all-knowing beings anymore sometimes it interacts with the anthem in in uh, dangerous and unpredictable ways and the people of the world call these these events cataclysms they're really dangerous they can like reshape entire regions they can you know obviously cause a lot of destruction and chaos and the largest of these cataclysms, according to the game, is called the Heart of Rage. At the very beginning of Anthem, you are a rookie freelancer. Freelancers are basically goody two-shoes pilots who, who use these the javelins, the exosuits that you play the game zipping around in, to deal with monsters and try to silence relics and basically keep everybody safe. So you're a rookie with a bunch of other freelancers going into the Heart of Rage trying to silence it meaning trying to silence the Shaper Relic at the heart of the Cataclysm that caused all of this chaos. And as you might expect, things do not go according to plan because it's the very first mission in the game, and of course you're not going to be a big damn hero right at the beginning of the game. Everything goes to You don't silence the Heart of Rage, you have a apparently a huge falling out with your team, even though the game doesn't really explain that much at all. And two years later, freelancers are distrusted by everybody because they failed one time, which the game also does not explain. And you are trying to eke by a living in a badly malrepaired javelin doing hings left and right when you conveniently get the mission of a lifetime dropped into your lap to go back to the Heart of Rage and try to silence it. Only this time you have a generic bad guy on your tail who wants to take control of the relic at the heart of the Heart of Rage for generic bad guy reasons, mainly because he doth desires the power. And that's the plot. That's the main plot. And I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm summarizing, but that's the main plot. It does not get any really deeper than that. It doesn't get more interesting than that. And the way that the story is told is... It's a good example of why you need to do show, don't tell in stories and why just telling people what happened and what's going on doesn't really allow the audience to engage as much because they, that's what happens a lot. You get told things by people, by talking heads. You get one really awesome cutscene that sets up the creation of the Heart of Rage, but it's a cutscene in which you are just being told what happened by another character instead of participating in it and actually having a stake in what's going on. So so far too heavy on just being an exposition yeah. delivery system. Yeah, there's, I mean, there are character moments and those are actually the stronger parts of the story, um, especially the NPCs that you get to talk to. Yeah, we had a few of those in the demo that you and I talked about, but we, there's also a lot that were blocked off. So yeah. is there more than just like the bartender per se that you can get into as in-depth a conversation with? There are a lot. There are a lot of NPCs over the course of the game, some of whom give you quests and others are there just for you to have conversations with and kind of you know get a little bit more information about the world and whatnot and almost all of them you can talk to multiple times and they'll have their own little little sort of conversation arcs as you go through and making rudimentary left or right dialogue choices which some do seem to affect what happens to people there were a few people i talked to that um, if i had made different decisions i could have changed what happened to them some of those interactions can actually have an effect on what happens to the people. Um, like there's, there's one guy that you, his wife asks you to talk to him because he seems to be having some trouble and you can eventually discover that he isn't who he says he is. And your decisions can determine whether or not the two of them can work things out or if something I, I don't want to reveal it because it was actually kind of an interesting plot twist, but like you can you can basically decide whether or not he has a happy ending or if he 
ends up probably getting interrogated and maybe tortured or whatnot. So, like, you can do that, but once you talk to people and their stories are done, they disappear for the most part from the world. There isn't a larger kind of impact on you know, your decisions like if you do this, you won't run to this character out in the world. You won't, uh, apparently, I don't think you have different quests that you can undertake depending on your choices in conversations. So it's nice and it's nice to have those rudimentary dialogue choices and your character is voiced. So it's nice to have that kind of experience, but it's not, it's not on the same level as previous Bioware games by a long shot. And the characters themselves, while they, they're they they're okay, there are a few that I really liked, but they also are not on the same level of Bioware's previous excellent characters, so, you know, from Mass Effect, Dragon Age, all that. I don't know how much we can really say it's up or up to Bioware standard or not, because, I mean, the people that made those Bioware games we love aren't really with the company anymore. Uh, the, the guy who, who uh, co-created Dragon Age Inquisition even, uh, even left Bioware during Anthem's development. It's... It's not the same Bioware anymore. So people like wishing for the days of, I don't know, KOTOR and Baldur's Gate and, and Mass Effect 1. I mean, they should probably look and see what, what Obsidian's working on or something. Well, yes, but it is still called Bioware. There's a certain amount of pedigree that people associate with the company, no matter who. I mean, people leave and join companies all the time. There are people that left Bioware in the middle of Mass Effect's development, the trilogy's development. So I'm not saying that... It all should be exactly the same as back in Mass Effect 1. What I'm saying is it is a step down from what it was in the past. Yeah, and then and then that's certainly true, yeah. Yeah, they're both valid points that you bring up, and it's a question of is it, yeah, the particular team that you want to follow and see what work they've continued that is in this vein, or it's as Caitlin was saying, that they've established a benchmark, and you would think the company would adhere to that and, and remain on that course, but... Clearly, there has been a decline, even as fans would argue, even in the Mass Effect series, that possibly because people left midway through that it changed the, the direction of that entire project and possibly it suffered for it, depending on who you ask. Yeah, so that is what it is. I, I'm i not sure. they Obviously, they can... Um, story, perhaps, is the one area that they can really make some changes on because they have a roadmap for future content there's a teaser at the end of the main story that introduces a potential new enemy. So they can always improve upon what they've already created. And I think that the the setting and the lore is ripe for that. I think that, that there's potential in the world they've created and the lore that they've created along with it. They just need to do a better job of telling the story, getting you invested in that story. Because that was, that was a, a major issue for me is the game starts off with your character failing to silence the heart of rage, I should feel motivated by that failure when the game circles around to me going back to the heart of rage to actually silence it this time. But I didn't. I didn't have any motivation, despite the fact that my character was present for that failed first attempt. If they can find ways to make the events in the future, future events in the story more personal and more... Uh, more motivating for you, you know, to, to give you more of a stake in what's going on, which I know sounds kind of weird because, like I said, you were there for the original attempt. How much more motivation do you need? But I hope that going forward with what they're going to do in terms of expanding the world that they can they can improve. And I mean, they certainly can. It's just a question of what do they have in store. To that point, do you think that maybe they're just playing it safe since... As, um, you know, people will comment, there's a lot on the line for the company as a whole. Do you think they came into this very ambitious endeavor trying to create a setting and a story and and the exposition thereof in just a safe, digestible way to kind of set the stage, see that it lands and people at least get it and get, and get into it before they really ramp it up and get a little more experimental and push boundaries a bit more with future content um i would not be surprised if they had development problems if if we learn down the road that they had development problems considering how long the game was in development for i don't i i would have expected more from the uh the launch experience to a certain extent though of course yeah i mean this is this is not a game that's meant to be complete when it was released, Bioware set up and down that that wasn't, it, it was going to be a continuing living story. So to a certain extent, yeah, I mean, they're not going to play all their cards 
right at the beginning. So which is why another reason why I think that they've got potential to improve things down the road if they can unveil some really cool stuff. But at the same time, you know, we're used to this a little bit with uh, with games like this. It took Destiny, Destiny 1, and um, I didn't really stick around very much for Destiny 2. But it took Destiny a while. It took Destiny probably, depending on who you talk to, a year or so to get good. The Division also took time to sort of uh, iron out kinks and whatnot. And it looks like Anthem's going to be kind of the same a situation it's just a question of you know how much are people willing to sort of put up with that kind of well it'll get good eventually it'll take a year to get good but it will get good and i know you know i'm sure there's some people that are listening to me saying this and saying oh but you love final fantasy 14 and realm reborn was awful and it didn't get good until heaven's word so maybe i am being a bit of a hypocrite here but i don't know there's a lot it's not just the story that's the problem with anthem there there are issues on almost every level of the game which can be fixed but it's just kind of like are people going to have the the desire to stick around and wait for those improvements to come out like I don't know. That's the biggest thing, yeah, is the time and the money investment of hoping the next patch, the next DLC, the next paid content will be better than the last and give you something to justify the investment of both time and money. And, I mean, they, we've seen Bioware struggle with this as well as they were also responsible for the um, Guild Republic online. And, again, they struggled to make that an online experience that people wanted to engage in and stay invested in. If I recall, I didn't play it myself. I was definitely down because I love Star Wars and wanted to do it, but I didn't jump in headfirst just by the the online model. is isn't something I can always jump in on the MMORPG front, but also I started hearing the negative press about it. Did either of you two ever try it out? Uh, I have not, but I want to now that I have a, a rig that can run the game nicely. I've generally heard good things about The Old Republic, but... A lot of it's been about the story, so I don't know what the word is about the gameplay itself. Right, and it might have been it got good, because I know I had a rocky start, but uh, Mike, it sounded like you were jumping in. Not really. I I have heard good things about the Old Republic. Uh, One of my friends was playing it quite avidly and kept insisting I try it just to get the smuggler root story (laughs) before going into Endgame, and uh, Bioware's done a pretty good job of supporting it for several years. I, I don't know. Um, I, I really, really liked my short time with Final Fantasy fourteen, but because of sort of how I try to move on from game to game to play as many experiences as I can, I am sort of moving even further away from the MMO model than I was previously. Uh, it, so e- even though I really liked KOTOR and I like Star Wars and I like a lot of uh, and I like good Bioware stories, I am not anywhere closer to trying out TOR, even though it does have its fans and uh, and some quite evangelical and enthusiastic fans and anthem might fall into that same sort of category by the way it's being built yeah if uh, i would also compare it maybe to elder scrolls online where it had an incredibly rough start but eventually found its audience and is now getting regular updates and uh and is a major success but still that requires a lot of resources and dedication uh from the parent company to get that going and i am not sure if ea is willing to commit to Anthem at that level, or if they just want to, you know, cut bait as early as they can and uh, focus on getting as many people uh, to play Apex Legends as possible. Um, yeah, it's a possibility. The free-to-play and, and also, game uh, that is doing so much yeah, better than... Yeah, it's, it, it came out the same month as Anthem and is doing in, so much better. And, and also, uh, I mean, Dragon Age 4 is in the pipeline, we think, so would... Uh, if if Anthem is a real dud and is not doing numbers that EA wants, they might insist that Bioware just just you know do the Mass Effect Andromeda thing and cancel planned DLC to focus on the next project. I I don't know. I, it's uh, but the reception to Anthem has seemed pretty cold to me. And that's and yeah, very unfortunate considering how promising the world was looking even back from those early presentations we got at E3, and. Going back to the point that Caitlin made about the long development cycle and expecting more, I mean, are we seeing, (laughs) this is another kind of Final Fantasy XV problem, where was was it announced too soon, perchance, and thus too much anticipation was built for the payoff? I mean, it was only announced two years ago at E3 2017. That was... So it definitely doesn't have the doesn't have the epoch long development cycle that fifteen had, but my understanding is it's been in development for maybe six years is what I keep hearing is six years. So it was in development for several years by the time that they unveiled it at E three twenty seventeen. And what they unveiled looked 
pretty close to what was a finished product. So I guess that's what made it all the more shocking when we got those few spotty demo weekends where things just weren't working out. And you would think, given where it was when you revealed it to us, you'd think most of it at that point was just polished. Well, that, see, they, they, they pulled a, an Ubisoft. They made it look much nicer than what they could actually pull off, I think. Or it was what they wanted and they had issues and they had to scale back. Like, we don't, we don't know until we find, have more information about what development was like. We don't know if that original uh, vertical slice that they showed in 2017 was intended to be the, the, the end experience and they had to scrap some of it and, and scale back or if the project was restarted at some point or whatever else might have happened. It's clear that that's, what, that's the experience they wanted to give people and you can see, you can still see that in the gameplay of the existing game, uh, that kind of experience they wanted to have. But the what what we ended up getting is just so fragmented and lifeless in a lot of respects that it's it's just it's not it's not on the same level as what I think they were trying to go for. So let me um, I guess let me talk about the gameplay a little bit so I can explain. Uh, what I mean by that. Yeah, I was going to ask if there was any positive points, at least in playing the game, even if the world's falling flat. Well, I'll get to that. This is not a positive point I'm talking about right now. Oh, this, is st- okay. this is still... <laughs> Here, I will... I tried Anthem. I, will, I tried. I'm sorry. Since I've been ragging on it, let me say what's good about Anthem. It looks pretty. It does look pretty. It doesn't look as impressive as the reveal trailer, but that's, in this day and age, kind of to be expected that stuff doesn't look as awesome as it does when it's revealed. They had a great Twitter photo, yeah. but... It looks pretty. The des- the art design is great. There's some there is some really great facial animation in main some of the main story cutscenes. Not all of them. A lot of the NPCs kind of animate a little awkwardly, but there's some really good facial animation from main characters in a few of the main story cutscenes. The uh, ability to fly and hover in your javelin is a lot of fun and makes combat feel more dynamic um, and and fluid than your standard, you know, shooting shooter where you, you're stuck on the ground, the run and gun kind of thing. Yeah, um, so that's great. The basic basic combat in terms of like shooting and priming and detonating combos and the sort of different feel of the four javelin exosuits that you can run, which are the the all rounder ranger, the elemental uh, storm, the sort of fast and nimble melee focused interceptor, and then the tank colossus. That's all great, and that can be a lot of fun. And that's clearly kind of what they want you to focus on in the game is how much fun it is to fly around these uh, jungle like environments as Iron Man and shoot guns and rain down powerful uh, combo explosions with pretty particle effects and all that and that's fun that is fun yeah the demo showcased that well yeah but here's here's some of the problems with how that gets integrated into the gameplay so in order to do anything any of those missions you start you always start at fort tarsus which is your base of operations that's where you talk to all the npcs pretty much where you do pretty much all of your dialogue talking is at fort tarsus you can customize your javelins there you can pick up daily weekly and monthly quests that will get you coin which you can use to buy um, uh, cosmetic items for your javelins in order to do any missions you have to launch from fort tarsus and you get a huge ass load screen that is very dull and boring because it's just a static image and some really stupid tutorial tips that you already know by that point you can only when you do a mission, you load into the this, the overworld that you can explore in free play, the entire overworld. But it's a cordoned off part of that overworld. That's just for that mission, and you kind of do it by yourself, or you can do it with other people. You are tethered to your mission objective and your squad, so that if you want to explore, like there's a path going this way that you looks interesting, and you just want to check it out. If you stray too far and it's really aggressive tethering, you get told, oh, you're out of the mission bounds. You have 20 seconds to get closer or you're going to be transported. And a lot of times, depending on uh, how long it takes you to load into these instances, you might find that you have no choice but to get transported to where everyone else is. And that's another load screen. So there's that. You do your missions. And I kid you not, practically every mission in the game involves one of these really tried and dull and ugh, every game has these objectives. 
You hold a choke point. You have to use a stupid radar to find something. You have to collect items to silence relic. It's the same. It's the same thing. It's it's not like they they mix it up to t- sort of hide the fact that it's the same mechanic. It's the same mechanic that's used in pretty much every mission in the game. A lot of these side quests are literally just go to this one point and do this thing, and then oh by the way, I had this other thing I want you to do over there. Go do it, and then do that again a third time, and then mission complete. And when you're done with the mission, you get a result screen, another load screen, by the way, to get there. And then you return to Fort Tarsus for another load screen. And then to do anything else, you have to do the exact same process again. So every mission kind of loads you into a fenced-in area of the world in which you are uh, on a leash, basically, between the mission objectives and your party members. And then... You get you have to go back to Fort Tarsus and then load into another mission, which is another fenced-in environment, do the same thing over again, back and forth, back and forth. And there is a free play mode where you can blast around the entire world map, you can kill enemies, you can go into uh, the sort of dungeon-like uh, areas of the map that are used for, for, for missions and main story quests and fight monsters, get things. There are world events which are like... For me, like if you play Final Fantasy XIV, they're basically like fates. They're, you know, small objectives, taking out enemies or collecting um, echoes to silence relics and whatnot and things like that. But you can't you can't go into free play and launch side quest or main story missions from free play. You can't explore the whole world and launch a mission from a relative from a from a from a point that's uh, where you would start the mission anyway. Like Maybe I'm not explaining this uh, very well, but it's it's so weird that the main story, everything outside of free play, main story, side quests, everything is so compartmentalized and fragmented, even though it all takes place in the the big region that you explore at, through the entire game. Like every mission, you can you can literally go to pretty much everywhere that you're sent to in a main story or a side mission, even when you're not on that mission. So it's all part of this big world that you can explore. But you can't explore the world while you're doing it. You are fenced into that that small mission area, and it's repetitive in the sense that you know you you load from Fort Tarsus, you do the mission. It's repetitive mission objectives. You are forced to load back to Fort Tarsus when you're done, and then do it all over again for another mission. Some of which may take place in the exact same area, and it gets so tiresome. It's it's partly the load screens, but it's also the the uh, the way they they fence you in to doing these individual missions as part of a much larger world, and that they clearly want you to explore the world. Free play is there for a reason. The world is beautiful. It's got a lot of verticality. It's got interesting, weird monsters that you can fight. It's got you know stuff to uh, treasure chests to explore, things like that. And, and it's so restrictive in how you're allowed to explore that world if you're doing anything other than free play. So it just kind of, it kills that sense of this is a big, dangerous, beautiful world that you're going to fly around and explore in because you literally have uh, chain mail, or chain mail, you literally have chain link fences uh, alongside you for most of the story content of the game. Well, one game that comes to mind for myself and Mike uh, that kind of, I feel, does this right with Monster Hunter World in that they just kind of give you a time limit. So you can run amok and depart your entire team if you decide to play with other people while achieving your hunting objective, and it doesn't force you to come back. But then again, also, there's not really plot story points that you need to kind of be present for. So that's one thing that I feel, unfortunately for the convenience of other players, they're trying to keep you tethered along. Yeah. But otherwise, as long as you're able to finish the mission objective within that, like, 30 to 50 minute time frame you are free to roam all about the area which each area well you get to know them pretty intimately are still pretty big wouldn't you say mike oh yeah there's only there's only uh five important play areas in the game and plus a handful of smaller like more arena ones or more focused ones but they're enormous and there's a lot of stuff to do and uh even if you're not in a mission and the typical time for a mission is 50 minutes that's five zero not one five minutes and uh you, you can just do a just explore one of those areas on a non-mission specific uh, task that has no time limit and uh, but also doesn't have any you know multiplayer objective hanging over your head 
So uh, most of the stuff in Monster Hunter is timed objectives, but they also give you a sandbox version of that if you want. But uh, you, you get better rewards for completing objectives. So it's a they, 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 uh, Monster Hunter gives you multiple ways of experiencing the game settings and monsters, but it looks like Anthem, I don't know, it, it seems like really frustrating quest design that wants to have sort of multiplayer objectives and and feel more open, but doesn't give you a lot of freedom in either of those things. Well, it's like, remember when they showed us at 2017, you you started in Fort Tarsus, you, lo- you got into your javelin, there was no low time, you were just in your javelin, walking outside the fort, your friend joined outside the fort, and then you just started flying through and, and doing stuff. I'm not saying that the game should have been like that. I'm, I do think that they could have hidden the load screens by doing something similar to that. In fact, they actually do that for matchmaking. There is an animated graphic that is in-game. It's in-game engine because it shows your javelin, your character face, your customizations, but it's only for matchmaking. They could easily, I think, uh, address the load screen complaints if they did more of that for actual loading. But, like, the sense of the world they wanted to show in that opening was that this is a huge world that you can just go off and explore and do anything you want in. But, yeah, as, as, it, as it stands, outside of free play, which you, can't, you can't do that. All of your missions are launched from Fort Tarsus, and they're all in these very small chunks of the world. And I mean, yeah, there's. I'm, I'm not like completely ignoring some of the uh, the issues they had to obviously uh, deal with with regard to you know this is a game that's meant to be played with other people. So how do you how do you keep everybody focused on the objective and and you know you don't want them necessarily to just fly off to the opposite end of the map while you have three other people who are trying to actually do the mission. So I can I can appreciate that, but. The way in which that they're they're trying to corral players is just it's it can be really frustrating. I mean, I'm playing the game on an SSD, but I imagine people playing on a hard drive when they load in, there's a very good chance that they load into a mission and the other players are already away from the start point on their way to the objectives. It even happened to me, and I'm playing on a really fast uh, SSD where sometimes I would load into a mission and I guess people were further along when I got in there. There's no way to control whether you join a mission in progress or not. So sometimes you do get thrown into a mission that's already started. And you don't start where everyone else is. You start where the mission was supposed to start. So sometimes you load in, everyone's like half a mile away. And even if you try to get there as fast as possible, you can't. And the tethering kicks in and you get another load screen and get transported. So, I mean, it's stuff like that that's frustrating. And I, I understand why they had to do it, but I feel like there could have been other things they could have done to control it. Like, have a kick function. Let people kick someone if they decide to go off to the the ass end opposite side of the map during a story mission, if they're not, you know, cooperating. They could have... I I refuse to see why they couldn't have had missions be startable from the free play map. Like, since everything starts on the free play map to begin with and then just gets sent to a corralled chunk of that world, why not just have mission icons on the free play map that you fly up to and it asks you if you want to start the mission and then it match makes you and if you have to do a load screen, okay, fine. But at least you could you could be in the free play map, you could explore, go to a mission marker, do that mission, and then have a choice to either go back to Fort Tarsus if you want or return to free play and do and then do another another mission that would kind of address you know some of the the realities of the game design like how do we match people up with other players and do these missions but still allow you to feel like you can jet around the world at your leisure and you know oh go there and do that quest oh maybe there's a world event over there i want to do and then i want to do another quest you know there there are, there are things that they could have done Here's another example. Um, You cannot change your weapon loadout when you're on a mission. You can only change your equipment when you're back at Fort Tarsus. And that's obviously, to me, probably meant to dissuade people from sitting around in the middle of a mission, looking at their their gear drops and holding up the rest of the, uh, the experience. So I get that. But, like, 
Mass Effect Andromeda was a single player game that had a really easy solution for that. And it was, you can only change your loadout when you go to a forward operating station. So why not do something like that? You, there are transport vehicles called Striders that I guess people use. They're really awkward looking, basically like thinly veiled ADAT uh, copies from Star Wars that they're used to transport people. And they're all over the place in free play because you start... When you go, when you launch a free play, you can start from various different points of the the world map, basically on a strider. Why not have the option to like go to one of these striders and change your loadout if you want? So it's just there. Are, there's a lot of really weird gameplay decisions like that. Definitely elements that they probably, if they looked at something like Monster Hunter World, I think handles that sort of thing well. And yeah, they could have just had it between matchmaking but you're still hanging out on that main map you can yeah go to your point and do the whole change up and then go find that mission point start it up again get the matchmaking going and then you haven't inconvenienced anyone you're just jumping in when you're ready and it would have been fine yeah and again i don't see why they couldn't fix some of these things um they won't they cannot fix everything because of the way the the engine and the game is designed and that would require like major restructures i don't i don't think they're going to pull a final fantasy 14 a realm reborn where they just completely rework it i don't yeah would let them yeah i don't i don't think so i mean i would love it if they did but i don't think so but there's there are things they can do there they are releasing a patch soon that's going to have like apparently uh over 300 changes but i don't know if we have full patch notes yet so a lot of that is actually going to address some some weird bugs that somehow made it into the game like level 1 weapons being more powerful than the uh, ultra rare um masterwork and legendary weapons right that was pretty hilarious so um they will obviously keep improving things and i expect to see them make some changes to to gameplay structure and whatnot or, or at least what they can it's just again it's a question of if you were someone who played the game this past month and really got turned off by it and frankly i'm one of those people i really got turned off by it are you going to want to come back to it? Now, they are going to be releasing a Cataclysm, which I think we're all expecting is basically their version of a raid in the coming months. I think right now, I think it's scheduled to come out like around May or thereabouts. And we'll see what that entails and uh, if it if it shapes if it shakes anything up. There were also supposed to be things like shaper storms that they showed um, in that initial reel reveal, which looked really interesting. It was like a possibly random just really violent energy storm that you could i guess fly into and get swept up in and it wasn't really clear what you were doing but it had the potential to be like this fun kind of event that you would do if those find a way somehow into gameplay either as part of the cataclysms or something separate that could be cool something to uh motivate people to go out into the world and do things but have a bit of a random kind of element to it that could be fun but See, and this is the other thing is like the end game of this game boils down to basically doing these, frankly, boring missions over and over again on higher difficulties. And, you know, it's a looter shooter. There's grind. At a certain point, you are always going to be redoing content when you're trying to grind to get weapons. But part of the point is there is no end game raid content for at least a few months now. So... Right now, all people are doing is grinding. Usually, they're, they're grinding the the dungeons, the strike like dungeons called strongholds, over and over again on higher difficulties to get the uh, the upper tier gear. But there's nothing to do with it other than just play the existing stuff on harder difficulties. And so, like, I'm I'm want to see what the cataclysm is going to be like because depending on what that brings to the game, that could help alleviate some issues and breathe some life in. But again. It's not coming out until probably at least May, which is at that point three months uh, after the game's launch, depending on when in May it comes out. And are people going to stick around for it? Are they going to come back for, for that? I'm not sure if I'm going to come back for it. So yeah, Anthem is a game and it does some things good, but most things not so good. And there are some things it does incredibly badly. And I think it can be salvaged 
if Bioware takes has the time and the the resources to to work on it, and if people are willing to let them work on it and not just you know completely walk away from the game, which I wouldn't blame them if they do because it's just kind of a it you know Mike is you you are right in that this is this is clearly no longer the Bioware of yesterday yesteryear. And I guess some of us were just kind of holding on to hope that they can, they can make a, a comeback. But um, I don't know. I think a lot of us might be moving on to hoping that Dragon Age Four is that Dragon Age Four will continue to be a thing and won't get canceled, and that it will be a magical return to form for Bioware. So I'm, cause... I'm so worried about Dragon Age Four because uh, Dragon Age Origins is probably my favorite Bioware game. Which I don't. This is probably not a very popular opinion, but and I uh, and I love Inquisition and sometimes apologize for Dragon Age Two, <laughs> but <laughs> I'm uh, I, I I really want Dragon Age Four to be good, but the past two years or even longer of Bioware has not been very comforting. Or um, so I I don't know what to think. Like I'm I want to be excited for Dragon Age Four, but like I said, this isn't the Bioware that made the Dragon Age games I love, and I don't know what to think anymore. It's um. I haven't completely jumped ship. I'm gonna watch every Dragon Age trailer I reasonably can, and uh, and I'm gonna very closely follow that game's launch and its critical reception. But I don't know what to think. Uh, I mean, not just Caitlin. A lot of people are really cold and disappointed um, by Anthem. Yeah. yeah. And well, we can only see what happens, I guess, for the company as a whole at this point. But it sounds like Anthem definitely has a, a bit of an uphill struggle to attract and retain its audience through the coming months, but we'll see what happens when the next DLC drops in May. And if yeah, Caitlin's worst case scenario of everyone stops caring by then is comes to pass, then they definitely are going to have more issues than they'd like. But if they can definitely turn the ship around and make it engaging, then we might have something really neat on our hands and have a very different discussion next year about this game. But speaking of games that I think everyone, uh, all seem really excited about because it's really hard not to find the entire Pokemon series really endearing. We got some really great news dropped. It was a week and a half ago now. Uh, yeah, the um about about a week and a half or two weeks ago on the Nintendo Direct, they announced Pokemon Sword and Shield, and then had a couple follow up images and uh, and social media posts, but not not a whole lot of information. Just a just there was a uh, some images of a Pokemon gym which was about the size of a stadium and uh and, and just a, just a, a lot of questions and not a lot of answers yet because the pokemon sword shield version doesn't come out until fall but uh yeah a, 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 the pokemon hype is building and i even started a uh, well i started the poke playing a pokemon game a, a few days after the direct because i was feeling the hype so much did they did they say fall it's no, like late 2019. It said late 2019, but every single major Pokemon release is in October or November. So I okay. I would be shocked if it wasn't the case. Well, to that point, and speaking to that hype is what we're here for. And I've brought in a special guest correspondent, once again, our Pokemon expert, Gwen Riley, my Hello. stepdaughter. Hi, Gwen. Hi, Gwen. Hi. Uh, Hi. She's here to join us in uh, what can only be wild speculation of kind of the, the stuff we would love to see happen in Pokemon Sword and Shield. Uh, Gwen has been a Pokemon fan basically as long as I've been in her life that I can remember, whether it was the cards or a TV show. Uh, and I do remember when I first met her, she would uh, borrow my 3DS and play Pokemon Y a bit and run around catching Pokemon and naming them obscure things since she was still learning how to read at that point. <laughs> so that was really funny. But uh, since then, you've gotten Pokemon Moon, right? And that was yeah. your first Pokemon game you've played through by yourself so far? Yeah. Where are you at in that game? Have you beaten it yet? Mm, I'm stuck in the cave area right now. Oh, how many, uh, w w which island are you on? Um, I don't know. Their okay, yeah, they, they, have, <laughs> they, they have a lot of, the, the islands have funny names that sound like Hawaiian islands, so they're hard to remember. Yeah. Gwen, which Pokemon did you pick for your starter? I picked the Litten, the fire type. Nice. Yes. Because I'm a fire type starter. Oh, okay. Picker. She's definitely a fan of them. Yeah. I I like picking the grass starters because I I think they look funny. I like the little bow tie on uh, on on Rowlet. I thought that was cute. <laughs> He's a little owl with a, a grass owl with a leafy bow tie. Mm -hmm. It's definitely tempting. If I had picked up Sun or Moon, I probably would have gone Rowlet as well. He looks mm -hmm. very dapper. I I played I played Pokemon Moon version uh last summer 
So I, I, I remember it pretty well, because it, it was less than a year ago I finished it. Well, Gwen got super into uh, Metopia and uh, recently Undertale, so she hasn't been back to Pokemon Moon, I don't think, for a while yet. So hence why it's possibly a little hazy for her. But we're here yeah, to talk... I moved back to it already. Oh, did you? You just can't quite remember the details <laughs> of where you're at? <laughs> yeah. Totally fair. You got lots going on. But we're, yeah, we're here to speculate about uh, Pokemon Sword and Shield, so I thought we'd uh, all kind of s- talk about our hopes and dreams there, and we'll just kick it off with uh, with Gwen here. So what's what's one thing that you would really love to see them bring to Pokemon Sword and Shield? So one of these things is something for the new evolution. Right, which we'll probably get one of those. And what do you? What's your? What kind of evolution do you hope we get? Um, I don't know, but just for any type, I hope it's stronger than Sylveon because so far Sylveon is the strongest. Yeah. So yeah. Sylveon's very, very strong. Uh huh. Okay, and because because uh, fairy, fairy type is a little, I don't know if it's OP or not, but fairy type is very strong, and Sylveon has good stats and has a lot of tricks. So um, Sylveon's good. Uh, we got Sylveon. In Pokemon XY, and then there was no new evolution in Pokemon Sun Moon. So I think we, I think oh, it is, really? I think it is time for a new one. Yeah, I agree. What kind of type would you want to see, Mike? Well, my favorite Pokemon type is Ground, so I would love to see some kind of Sandion or Soileon or or something because they're just a, an EV that can throw out a good earthquake and then and switch into electric attacks safely is uh, what I'd be into. That'd be pretty neat. I'm kind of into like. A flying type. Ooh, you know, okay. Like maybe Arion or Windion. <laughs> yeah, with a, with a little, like Pegasus Windion. kind of Pokemon, uh, Eevee. Yeah. Like, finally get an Eevee with wings. Now, my Ooh, my, cool. my Sand Eevee could not do a thing against your Flying Eevee because Flying is immune to ground attacks. Yep. Yeah. Yours would win in, immediately. <laughs> As could happen. If it was stronger than Sylveon. Oh, yeah, yeah. Have you found uh, the various evolutions endearing, Caitlin? Is there any one that you would want to see happen? Um, I don't have enough background in the series. To, I don't even know which ones there are, to be honest. I, I think, I, I think they are super cute, though. They're all kind of adorable. Um, and I'm on that ship with you. I'm not as familiar, and I didn't even realize there wasn't a new one in Sun and Moon, but I've always loved the Eevees. Yeah, they, they don't add one every generation, but they, uh, I think there's eight now, not counting original Eevee, because uh, there's th- yeah. Yeah, three in Gen 1, then two in Gen 2, and then, tw- yeah, eight total. Yeah, so, and uh, and they're all very cute and um, and pretty strong. So, uh, like, for uh, for a long, since the very beginning, I think Vaporeon's my favorite, but uh, they're, they're all really cool, and I would love to see another Eeveelution, especially if it was a ground type. <laughs> Well, that's pretty neat. Um, over to you, Mike. Is there anything that you really want to see coming into uh, Sword and Shield? Well, I want to see what kind of gameplay tricks they have because in uh, in XY they introduced uh, Mega Evolutions, which are really fun, and then in Sun Moon they introduced uh, Z Super Moves, which I also really like. So I want to see what what kind what kind of special Pokemon strategy they add to Sword Shield, and I have no earthly idea what it could possibly be, but I definitely want to see that but mostly i want to just see the new pokemon and explore the new world because i think that's the most fun part about pokemon just see the new cool monsters that you can train and explore the crazy pokemon world that they have and i think we mentioned a minute ago that uh sun moon is was inspired by the hawaiian islands and this this new setting is inspired by great britain so that yeah, so, yeah. Region. yeah so it, lo- it looks like there's a, a a traditional like british boarding school that's more than a little bit hogwarts like is, is is part of the setting, and they uh, and they also showed um, giant gyms that look like big uh, soccer stadiums, and you know, mm-hmm. and and we know that uh, the UK is crazy about soccer, so maybe Pokemon battles will be like b- with with huge cheering crowds instead of just instead of just you and a gym leader in a room at the end of a building. <laughs> More akin to what we saw in the TV series. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, sort of like the uh, what Pokemon League was like in the TV series. Because in in the games, when you fight the Pokemon champion, it's you're just in. It's just two people in a room. It's like if Pokemon's the most popular thing in this world, then I don't know. Maybe Pokemon matches should be televised. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and Gwen was talking to me earlier. She was wondering, kind of like, what this the gym's gonna look like, or the stadium that the Elite Four is gonna be in. Yeah. Yeah. The um the image they showed us was it was it had a big leaf on the front of the stadium so I think it's probably a, like a grass gym that's early in the game but we have no idea 
what uh, it's going to look like. But people are just guessing like crazy because we've only had about two weeks of information. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then speaking of like the mega forms and the primal forms were a thing that came up in uh, Ruby and Sapphire, which you were playing right now. And they're more or less just a mega form with a different name. Like what really differentiates yeah. primals mm-hmm. from mega? Primals is, a, is just the name for uh, th- the three main legendary Pokemon. No. in uh, oh Only two because the only third two. one is, is called a mega. The two other Rayquaza doesn't have a primal form, or it's, it's no. called something else. It's called Mega. Oh. Okay, I haven't I haven't fought Rayquaza yet. I'm I'm only <laughs> in the uh, I I just beat the eighth gym in uh, in Alpha Sapphire, but I have not I haven't fought Rayquaza yet. There's they added a bunch of new story. Of, there's a there's a girl who has a dragon Pokemon who I'm chasing around, and she I think she's gonna lead me to Rayquaza. That sounds legit. But I uh, yeah. But I but I I, I did catch primal um, Kyogre. And I, uh, I'm having a lot of fun in in Alpha, in Alpha Sapphire, but I'm not quite done with it yet, and I'm really distracted by Devil May Cry Five right now. Mm. Well, and, and Gwen was saying though, the with the Megas, she's hoping that the starters get some new Megas, right? Yeah, like oh yeah, mm-hmm. the final evolution of starters. Like it's just plain weird if the first evolutions get a Mega. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's totally fair. And I think we have Megas for. The Generation One starters, like uh, Charizard, yeah. Venusaur, Blastoise, and we have them from uh, Alpha, Alpha, and Omega. We have them for Swampert, Skeptile, and Blaziken, but no other starters have Mega evolutions. Yeah. Is uh, Gwen? Is there an older Pokemon that doesn't have a Mega evolution that you want to see get a Mega? Stantler. Stantler. Yeah. All right. Okay. <laughs> I'm into it. Why do you want to see Stantler get some love? Because like. I saw that Stantler wasn't getting love, and, like, I don't want any Pokemon to get left behind. <laughs> well, there may be hope for Dunsparce, then. Here's Dunsparce? Thing. Dunsparce doesn't have, like, any evolution or anything, either. Does it? Uh, oh, no. Dunsparce is just a, a sad-looking fish. <laughs> yeah, it's that weird, like, <laughs> poopa fish thing, whatever that was in. I think it was X and Y it was brought in. It's like the yellow... Oh, no, no. Dunsparce thing. has been... A- Dunsparce has been around a while. It's, oh, it's, it's Gen yeah. two or Gen, it's it's Gen two or Gen three. Uh, but I'm i it's been a long time since I've played any of those. Are you sure? Because in the anime, I saw Dunsparce. So maybe got some in there as well. But it, yeah, it definitely doesn't getting any love as far as extra uh, evolutions go. So it's a question of will they bring some yeah. stuff to the yeah. It's it's you're basis. right. I I said I said Dunsparce was a sad looking fish, but you're right. It is a snake, and it's a uh, <laughs> it's a and it was from Generation Two, uh, oh, Gold wow. and Silver, around uh, around ninety nine or two thousand is how long it's been around. Yeah. Caitlin, are you looking to pick up Sword and Shield? Like, is this the time where you're going to jump back in? Maybe it depends on what else is coming out around there. Like, if Cold Steel Three comes out around the same time, sorry, Pokemon, but no. That's totally fair. <laughs> We're hoping uh, that Gwen can maybe pick up one version because what was the one you would want most definitely? Sword. We're hoping she could pick up Sword over at her dad's house, and then I might pick up Shield for us at our house. So then at least we can trade and compete between our two switches. Yeah, and you and you, you yeah you can trade the different Pokemon that are exclusive to the versions, so uh, Gwen can max out her Pokedex. That's the hope. Yeah. And then vice versa. I wonder what they'll be though. Yeah, what's one? Oh, it's crazy. One one thing I was wondering: we've gotten a lot of inanimate object Pokemon's lately. We had like Clefki, oh, we yeah. had Chandler. So what's your random ghost possession? you know, thing that you hope to see in this one. An armor. An armor. Like a oh, haunted yeah. armor because We got there there was a haunted sword in Gen six. Yeah. Edge of slash. Yeah, yeah. Well it's hone edge, then double edge, then age of slash. Right. And uh but we have not gotten an armor before, I think. No, we've gotten some stuff that looks kinda armored, like sh- is it shelter or whatever? The one in that you Sh shelter's a seashell. Is, <laughs> oh great, you're no, there's one that like they, they look different and you have to trade the two different Pokemon with each other and then they are, the next evolution looks like the evolution of the one that was traded. Uh, uh that I think that was in black and white. Um Oh, I'm not I'm not sure what you mean. I uh, can't remember the, uh, what the uh, ones were, but there was one that kinda of looked like a knight armored head. But yeah, we definitely haven't gotten like a full suit of armor. Golurk, I guess, is probably the closest yeah get Golurk is a big goal and then you have a then you have a oh shoot uh Kofor Gigas the the whatever the uh one that looks like a sarcophagus yep. like an Egyptian mummy but I don't think there's one that's a, like a big full suit of armor so really some neat. Pokemon 
Like, and uh, some Pokemon look like they have armor. But an actual uh, possessed but... suit of armor just seems like it would make sense. Yeah. yeah that's, mm-hmm. a good that, 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 that's, that's Dragon Quest as heck, and you know I love that. <laughs> that's true, you do. I don't know if Gwen's ever actually done any Dragon Quest yet. It's going to be Dragon something Quest? in her room. Dragon Quest is a, a very old series that has a lot of funny, cartoony monsters in it. And it does have some uh, ghostly armor in Dragon Quest. Uh, the monsters uh, do look it, very Pokemon-y, actually. Yeah, and there's even a series of monster hunting, <laughs> of monster catching Dragon Quest games True. called Dragon Quest Monsters, it was really fun. which are uh, which, are, which are pretty good. But I like the regular Dragon Quest games better. Gwen, they're 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 cute little RPGs. They're like fairy tales. Uh, my fa- my favorite one is about uh, a, a princess that got turned into a horse, and so um, her best friend uh, takes her across the land to try and turn her back into a princess. That's so oh. cool. Which one was that it's one? A, it's that's Dragon Quest it's Eight. Eight. Uh... Mm-hmm. That's the one that everyone has said very good things about, and I really want to give it a shot. Eight is it, it's hard to say what the most popular one is or what the best one is, but eight is a a lot of people really like eight. Eight's a good one. Caitlin, back to you for a question. What would be the th- one thing that would make this game like a, I have to have it? Um, that's a really hard question. I don't know. <laughs> like if you could uh, just go around and pet all the Pokemon. Not necessarily in like the little special like petting mode, but like actually when you're walking around the world, would that make it just the interaction with every Pokemon you see? Uh, well, you know, that was something that I liked about Let's Go, but it was limited to your partner Pokemon. And right. it'd be cool if you could pet all the Pokemon. Hmm. Just with your them team. Being, uh, your team. <laughs> or whatever. Yeah. Like, I don't know. That that was kind of the thing that was. I I think I started watching the anime before I picked up a Gen 1 game, and that was kind of the whole experience. I mean, it, Pikachu was obviously still the focus for, for, for Ash, but, like, he made friends with all the Pokemon that he mm. would use in battle, and it, I never got that feeling from, from the games. And, of course, you know, Gen 1, it wasn't super focused on that but still like and i like that about let's go i like that your partner pokemon you can dress them up and you can pet them and you can feed them but you know it'd be nice if you could sort of have build the relationship with all of your pokemon even though that would be a very daunting task considering how many pokemon there are in (laughs) each generation well they've had that from x and y where like they had the i forget what the actual mode was called do you remember what it was called mike where you go into little pet your pokemon or gwen Oh, um, in I don't Pokemon remember. Sun and Moon, no, I don't remember. But I can remember that you could pluck off the well, pluck off the, but kind of brush off the dirt or sand or dry your Pokemon. Oh, gotcha. It yeah. might be called affection mode. I don't remember. Yeah, they have that in Sun and Moon. Is all also there? There's like a little farm or a little house you can go to and uh and see your po and see your Pokemon run around and clean them off and pet them. There'll probably be something like that in Sword and Shield, but I don't know how deep it'll go. We should be in Nintendo Dogs mode only with Pokemon. <laughs> <laughs> well, is there anything that you like about Pokemon Let's Go Pikachu Eevee that you think would translate well to? the standard generation uh well i really i really liked no random battles in let's go but we that's already yeah. not a thing yeah so. nathan was saying too he wished it would return to that yeah we got tall grass and random battles again which is i don't know it's getting harder and harder for me to appreciate random battles in rpgs now because they they seem so artificial i've said this in other podcasts i think but if a game has random battles I want ways to manipulate them, like in like in Bravely Default, where you can turn them on and off. I I want something like that in in any game with random battles, and I don't know. I guess using a max repel will work that way in a Pokemon game, but it's uh I don't know. There's I'm I'm excited for uh, Sword and Shield version, but I'm not excited for random battles in Tall Grass. <laughs> I mean... Wait, I think so. For the trainers in random battles, you. When you talk to them, that's when the battle starts, if it's mm-hmm. the triggered trainer. But, like, if you don't talk to them, you can just walk past. Yeah, you, you can avoid trainers. I was I was talking about when I'm trying to catch Pokemon in the grass, and I just have to run back and forth until I fight one. I don't I don't like that as much. But but um but trainers, I, I I'm still glad that we'll have trainer battles. And it's uh and trainer battles are uh they work the same way in in uh in pikachu and eevee version right where you just they see you and they come yeah. at you yeah yeah okay yeah. Mm-hmm. are you saying you don't want that anymore like you'd rather engage them if you want to no 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 i i want i want uh 
tall grass battles to be able to switch on and off with like a repel button or something. Um, and having and being able to oh, like an XP share. Yeah, it, or the the XP share is also. Uh, I I like the XP share changes that they've made over the years. Mm -hmm. But uh, what I don't want is looking for Pokemon and having a random element to that. I uh, again, I want any game with random battles to be like Bravely, where I can turn them to low, medium, high, or off. Yeah, which is really a nice benefit for when you're just trying to get somewhere, especially in this day and age where sometimes you're like riding the bus and you're like, I just want to get to this next town in this like next three stops. But then when you're getting constantly halted by <laughs> random encounters, yeah, it becomes very frustrating. But they can still gate progress, but with trainer battles and gym battles. Like you can't yeah. just you can't just sprint through the whole game. You still have to. There are still things to ground for. Yeah, basically, basically boss fights that uh, you'll, that'll keep you in check. Agreed. But uh, but yeah, just I, I don't like random battles in the tall grass. I think Pokemon should move on with that, and I'm disappointed that's not coming across from Eevee and Pikachu, like Caitlin said a minute ago. I actually I wouldn't mind it if the random trainers in the field that you had to confirm that you want to fight them. That they don't force you into a fight It'd be when nice you if they asked. walk in front of them. Like, yeah. Like, you know, I'm just walking around, just, you know, catching Pokemon left and right. And suddenly this, you know, this this really peppy girl or maybe this bug lass. catcher dude is, yeah, is right in front of my face. It's like, fight me. And I'm like, okay, what if I don't want to? What if I, what if there's a Pokemon over there that I really want to catch and you're in my way? Too bad. Don't you know the rules? We've made eye contact. Now we have to fight. <laughs> there is actually a trainer in Let's Go who's called Caitlyn, and I was kind of like, <laughs> um, "Well, there's a Pokemon called Solosis, and that's the that, that's the one that uh, jumps at me the most <laughs> regarding my name. <laughs> it's it's a psychic Pokemon from a uh, black and white version. It's pretty endear endearing for a blob. I think the um the stare the eye contact means you have to fight thing is like uh, almost like a. a a joking reference to samurai, where if, if 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 a samurai accidentally bump each other or make eye contact, then now they have to duel, kind of things like a very very exaggerated like nineteen seventies samurai movie kind of thing. <laughs> and from a culture reference, I understand that for sure. But I also I agree with Caitlin's statement that perhaps you know the idea of consent could evolve into Pokemon, considering also just there's so many gray areas that we've brought up in the Pokemon series of just the idea of battling these monsters so to speak is in itself a completely different discussion that we are all just okay with oh uh before she leaves can i ask gwen one more question absolutely uh gwen you, you know that a lot of pokemon are based on real animals like uh like rowlet's an owl and litten is a cat right yeah it, what what's a kind of pokemon and pokemon type that's that's like a real animal that you want to see in this game like like me i really like uh uh, I really like dogs, and I also my favorite uh, my favorite uh, type is ground. So I'd like to see like a hound dog that had ground powers or something. W what's your answer to that question? I would want to see a fox psychic type. Ooh, cool! Because psychic is my favorite type. And what about foxes? Foxes are my favorite animal. Match Aww. made. There's a fire fox in XY called Del Fox that has psychic powers, but that's not quite the same. That's, that's really Fennekin's final form, right? Yeah, it is. It's it, it's really more like a Firefox and not a Psychic See, now, fox. Gwen will appreciate this. So I have Let's Go Pikachu. Yeah. Where you cannot get Vulpix. You can only get Vulpix from Eevee. So I got... Oh. I have I have Pokemon Go on my phone, and I specifically walked around my neighborhood until I got and caught a Vulpix. So <laughs> now I can get a Vulpix in Let's Go Pikachu because I love Vulpix. Do you, you've seen the Alolan Vulpix, the, the Ice Fairy version? Mmm... <laughs> It's very it's cute. cute. <laughs> it's not. It's not quite the same, but it, but ice, uh, Alolan Ice Vulpix is is a cute Pokemon. Have you gotten an Alolan Ice Pokemon in Moon Gwen? I am looking for an Alolan Pokemon right now, but my rival has a Alolan Raichu. How can I don't get that? Mm. <laughs> Tell me all the places to find Pokemon, and definitely <laughs> that one. I'd yell that to him if I could. <laughs> uh, Greg, Greg, I think you need to have the talk with Gwen. You need to tell her all about GameFAQs.com. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, no. No, gonna, no, 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 no. She'll be lost in a, a really big rabbit hole, I'm sure. Save her from that as long as possible. <laughs> okay, okay. It's okay. We kept her away from 4chan, so I'm happy. <laughs> I was going to also mention for my part, uh, given the nature of the Galar region being uh, UK inspired, I want to see a Corgi Pokemon. 
I mean, there's <gasps> yes! that joke about the whole Queen of England with her corgis and stuff, but like, it just makes sense that we should get a corgi inspired Pokemon now. That would be cool. I would love that. I want to see a Haggis inspired Pokemon. <laughs> what would that even look like? An inside out. Uh, sheep. No, well, no, no, no. It would be. I mean, I mean, okay. Haggis is made from sheep intestine, but the, uh, the like the joke is that it's an actual animal with with unevenly sized legs, so it can run on hillsides. Uh, <laughs> it's a it's, it's a mythical like joke animal like like a I don't know like a sl- l- like a snipe or something it would be maybe maybe the American version but yeah I would like to see a haggis or maybe a Loch Ness monster Pokemon like a Nessie yeah Nessie as uh, like a mythical would just make sense oh yeah an updated Lapras maybe yeah but... yeah there's there's a potentially a lot of good mythological animals they could draw from if they're gonna not just you know UK but if it's gonna be kind of a European themed region. Yeah, like we could get banshees and yeah. as a ghost type, for example. Mm. What? And I would want to see like a griffin Pokemon. <gasps> yeah. Oh, that's cool. Like Hogwarts. And it would make sense given medieval fantasy rooted. There. Yeah, yeah, like the hippogriffs at Hogwarts, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that'd and be really. And also neat. for Gryffindor. I'm trying to think if there's a Griffin like Pokemon already, and I'm I'm not sure. Yeah, I can't. It doesn't bring one to mind for myself either, Hippogriff or otherwise. Mm-hmm. But that would be really neat if we got something like that. But at the same time, I think we were discussing all the potential for a UK animal themed Pokemon, and even you were saying, Mike, that in this last entry, they had like a Chinese dragon. And was one based on a Shetland pony or something? Is that as well? Oh yeah. Um. Uh. There's one of my favorite Pokemon from Moon is uh, is Mudsdale, which is a which is based on a Clydesdale horse. Oh. Right. Yeah. I yeah. know that. And yeah, so I, the... I really I remember remember Gwen. I really like ground types, and he's a big beefy ground type. Do you have one, Gwen? Yeah, I do. That's actually one of the Pokemon you get the rides. Oh, nice. Mm, yep. That's yeah, and true. I imagine they'll keep that in this next version too. The the way they've yeah. evolved from, oh, from yeah. Uh, HMs. Yeah, moving away from HMs is great. Yeah. Uh, I, I have not enjoyed going back to uh, Alpha Sapphire and having to deal with seven different HMs. That's 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 not fun at all. <laughs> Especially when your party can't handle all that. Yeah, basically I have two Pokemon on my team, uh, Sharpedo and Tropius, just for HMs. Yeah, they're your utility Pokemon. Yeah, they can they can cover all seven. Um, just with just with those two, so I, I really have a team of four with two, uh, you know, HM holders. That's the thing, right? It just takes up that spot that mm-hmm. would otherwise be reserved for making your powerhouse team. So you're just kind of wandering around with these utility Pokemon. So you're like, well, I sure hope I don't have to throw in Beedrill. It's, I mean, I'm 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 beating the entire game with uh, basically with just three Pokemon anyway. So it's not it's not that much of a challenge. But still, I, I would like I would like to have the freedom of a team of six rather than a team of four. Totally fair. Yeah. Well, before we move on from this, I think the classic question for any pokemon game is what starters are we all going to have i'll start off for myself as much as i'm usually a grass type i find sobble really endearing and i think yes. i'm probably going to be a sobble trainer are you in on that boat too caitlin i think i think so sobble is a precious boy <laughs> i really want to see sobble uh when they animate water gun or bubble or his uh his water attack at the beginning i want him to just cry out the water attack <laughs> having, 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 having it having it having it streaming out of his eyes <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Mike? Which uh, starter are you after? Um, I almost always pick the grass starter, and I really like the look of uh, of Grookey. I'm going to stick with him. I hope he evolves into a, a big, cool gorilla or maybe a monkey with, you know, with, like, leafy drumsticks playing big drums or something. I don't know. I, I, uh, I, I want to see what all three Pokemon look like in Final Evolution, but I'm going to start with my boy Grookey. And then they integrate, like, the uh, the Donkey Konga bongos finally. Bring those I would love that. Oh, oh, yeah. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. I, I, have, I have some Donkey Konga bongos in my closet in my basement, and if I can bust them out to, you know, to, for some Z-move or something, I would welcome it. Well, they had the adapter for the, the GameCube controllers. For uh, Smash, oh I mean, come on. That, that, that's a way to really freak out your Switch. P- plug in some GameCube bongos into it. It's like, like <laughs> what's going on? And last but not least, Gwen, what's a starter striking your chord? Um, I just want to say one thing about Grookey sure. first before I say the starter I want. So it will be funny if, like, on the final evolution, Grookey gets bananas that he throws on the ground to get lich seeds like open oh. and ready that'll be funny that'd be great if you got banana toss yeah as like yeah. leech seed or even as like um it lowers defense or speed or something like that because they can't run on the slippery banana peels 
That'd be pretty funny. Yeah. I hope he gets a Donkey Kong tie. That'd be a fun tie in to like dress <laughs> him up. If you can dress all the Pokemon, not just like a few boutique Pokemon, like in uh, Phone Sapphire. Throw in a Mario or Luigi hat or a Princess Peach crown on any of your Pokemon. Yeah, I can see that as being like DLC stuff for certain. So yeah, what was your what's your type? Oh Which no, I you forget the name. Does it start with the score? A look over here. Yeah, it's score buddy. There we go. Yeah, how come? I don't know. Is it just because of it's the fire type? No, not is... just because like for some reason Scarfunny feels like an old friend to me and I don't know why. <laughs> oh, oh yeah, no. because of Tristan, because he had three bunnies. Ah, uh, that makes sense. Tristan was a good friend of Gwen's who moved yeah. to the East Coast last year. So he isn't in school this year, but he had bunnies for you to get to to hang out with. Yeah. Aww. And is this following the trend? Uh, uh, knowing my Chinese zodiac, there is a yep, rabbit, right? Uh, yes, uh, rabbit is in the Chinese zodiac, but it's replaced by cat in the Vietnamese version. But this, uh, every fire starter is one is a part of the Chinese zodiac. You, you have to play around a little bit. Like uh, the, uh, in gen in Gen six, it's a fox instead of a dog, and in Gen two, it's a hedgehog and not a mouse. But it still fits the pattern. It's true, it's pretty close. And also, Charmander could be the dragon, and mm-hmm. Litten yep. could be the cat. Exactly. Yep, exactly. No, um, Litten, I think, is the tiger, because um, cat is not... the tiger. Yeah, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Tiger, tiger. Uh, tiger is in Chinese Zodiac, and uh, and cat is not. That makes more sense. The, uh, the, the, the There's a few myths about it. Like, the uh, one of... One myth about it is that basically the Buddha was was uh, in, sent an invitation for his twelve favorite animals to join him in enlightenment, and he sent an invitation to the cat, but the cat was lazy, so the the mouse <laughs> took the mouse took the invitation and told the cat it was on a different day, <laughs> and so so then that's why cats hunt mice uh, for eternities because they because the, the the rat cheated the cat out of being a spot in the zodiac. Oh, that's hilarious. Yeah, but um, I I kind of like the look of uh. Score Bunny because he looks like one of the main characters of Sam and Max. <laughs> it's true. He looks like uh, Max, right? Yeah, I, I, I hope I'm not wrong, but I believe I, yes. Uh, I uh, think Sa- Max is Sam the and rabbit. yeah, I believe, I believe Max is the rabbit. It's I a uh, um, Gwen. Sam and Max is an old video game about a dog and a rabbit that solve mysteries. Uh-huh. Uncle Pat's a really big fan of Sam and Max, although I don't know if he's ever, he has ever actually finished a Sam and Max. He really loves <laughs> Sam. And some Max. some of those old Sam and Max games are hard. Those uh, old old. Uh, 90s adventure games. A lot of them are really good, but they're hard, they're hard to finish. I've only beaten, I don't know, maybe two. I've done uh, one of the King's Quests myself. I've done Full Throttle and Grim Fandango, mm. and I. Uh, but other than that, I don't know if I've finished any of them. And I did some Day of the Tentacle. That one's really ridiculous. Yes, Day of the Tentacle is super good, but I have not finished it. I only started it. What Gwen do you think Score Bunny's uh, second type's gonna be, or what do you hope it's gonna be? Fire mixed with. I don't know, but. I think it might be cool if like mm-hmm. one of these starter gets starters gets a uh, like a weapon to go around like me. Kind of like Fennekin did. It had, like, no, not just Fennekin. Thing. Like, like maybe like Lucario that could get a spear out, like an energy, not spear, sorry, um, staff. An energy staff. Oh, was yeah. part of one of their moves. Yeah. Oh, that'd be kind of neat if it had that to manifest its power. Yeah. Kind of like how when when a- when Abra turns into Alakazam, he gets spoons. <laughs> <laughs> I've always loved that Mega Evolution idea where Abra gets like Mega Alakazam rather gets like a million spoons. <laughs> <laughs> well, a lot of people have been saying they hope Fire goes with uh, Fairy for Score Bunny, which would be an interesting mix to kind of cancel yeah. out its own uh, weakness there. Yeah, I, I would I would like if uh, if Fire got Fairy and if uh, if Sobble got dragon because then dragon would uh, would be able to dra- dragon's ice weakness would be canceled out and they also would uh, reduce the light the electric and grass weakness of water. So yeah. I, I would love if, if Sobble became a dragon for that reason. And I was gonna say the same actually. Yeah, I was kind of mm-hmm. speculating we get a water dragon or there'd be just the weird blend of water electric somehow. Could be fun. There is, I think there is a water electric. There's a, uh, there's an electric. Oh, the, fi- uh, the fish. One, yeah, there's, yeah, there's an electric angler, anglerfish called, uh, called lantern. Yes. And um, there is, there is a couple water dragons. One of the legendaries in, in uh, Diamond and Pearl was water dragon, Correct. and, uh, and Kingdra is water dragon. Uh, uh, I'm, uh, 
Yeah, yeah, Kingdra, yeah. What kind of sable do you want, Caitlin? Uh, dragon sounds good to me, but, you know, <laughs> I have very, so little experience in the games, I have no opinion of this, so... Oh, it'd be really funny if uh, sable took, like, a really dark turn and went water dark, just went completely either, like, emo and or angry to, like, uh, act well, out no. its sadness. Wait, we, no, 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 well, no. We, already got a, we already got a water dark with Greninja a little while ago. Oh, yeah, yeah that's true. And I'm, I don't know if you can beat a ninja frog with a tongue scarf. That's pretty cool. And we got a fire... A fire dark with like incineroar. Yep, that's right. Yeah, so it might they might go away from that. What about uh, Grookey? What are you hoping for in your grass type there, Mike? Oh, I don't know. Um, I kind of like grass steel because steel would give him a lot of resistances, but then it would make him double weak against fire, and I don't yeah. know if I want that. <laughs> I, I, I don't want another grass fighting because we already got that with Chestnut and Breloom is uh, is already the best grass fighting ever, so I don't know. It's a, it's it's hard to say. I, 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 w- I would like it to be something unusual. Like, I, I have I thought that making Decidueye grass ghost was really fun, and I, uh, I don't want another pure grass because they've already done that a bunch of times. And so, yeah, I guess my answer is grass steel, but I could go a number of ways. I went to the, the Sun Yetsen Gardens for a field trip. It's a Chinese garden in Vancouver, and it's lovely. Oh. And they didn't say that it was, like, the invitation story thing and, like, the mouth. That, that's just thing. one story that I yeah. read a long time ago. I don't know if it's real or not, but th- th- there's probably a lot of different ways. And different countries have their own different versions of the Zodiac. Like, in, in, in Vietnam, they replace the rabbit with a cat, I know, is one of, the, is one of them. But uh, it, it's different in all over the world. And the... The one that I heard was like there was a race and the cat and the rat got on the ox together and the rat didn't want the cat to get in it so the rat pushed the cat <laughs> off the ox into the lake. Rude. Oh. And then at the very end when the 12 animals got inside the poor kitty came up and tried to get inside but he was the 13th. Oh, oh. So there's one that's sympathetic to the cat, and there's one that is calling cats lazy. So it's, guess whatever myth you want to believe in, really. <laughs> Poor cat. cat. Cats are lazy, though. It, they definitely can be. That's why I recommend if anyone gets a cat, you get two, because they keep each other going. If this holds up, that means the, uh, the, gener- the next starter has to be either a sheep or a goat, or an ox, or a snake, or a horse. Yeah, have we gotten a, a fire rat? Yeah, that, that was Cyndaquil in Gen Oh, yes, two. right. Yeah, which is more like a hedgehog. Yeah, yeah, the fire rodent, and well, yeah, it's gonna be really fun to see kind of what we're gonna get out of all of these Pokemon in yeah. the next game. And do you think we'll get a new type? Yeah, I'm kind of thinking that we might get an ancient type or a royal type. Ooh, that would Ooh. make sense. Oh yeah. The, yeah, royal type would make sense. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's strange though. There was 16 types in the original Pokemon, and that and that was more than 20 years ago. So over 20 years, we've only gotten three new types. So it's a uh, it's it's rare to get a new type, but it would be really cool if they added. And there hasn't really been a pattern like every two games they add one or anything. Cause... No, yeah, they got they got fairy back in X and Y, and I think the reason they did it was because they felt dragon and fighting were too strong. So mm. they added fairy, which is strong against dragon and fighting. And I think the reason they added uh, dark and steel in Gen two was because psychic was way too strong in Gen one, and both uh, dark and steel are good against that. Right. And I think I think they also wanted to help. Uh, they wanted to help like bug and fire and a couple other types that were weak in Gen One, and so uh, dark and steel are, are are weak against those in in different amounts. But uh, so yeah, we could get a new type. I don't uh, I don't know what it would be though. I I have no idea at all. It's it, it, everything is speculation this early on. Yeah, because we've gone through so many of the different elements and this and that. I mean, I could foresee them having like a time type or something like that even would be interesting yeah that'd be cool actually however that would work i don't know i mean they've definitely had the games focus on time and space and such in the past but like how they would make a type that's time i don't know but i yeah. can foresee it like, big ben pokemon <laughs> it would be cool if like they add a light type because they have a dark type mm, that's but right they don't have a light type of fairies kind of taking the place but if they had a light in there they might be actually planning to make a new light EV the kill against mm, Ombreon. Yeah, I would I would I would ship that. And then Espeon will just walk away because like Espeon's the opposite of Ombreon and maybe I'll be against Sylveon. Mm. So would light would light type be strong against dark or weak against dark, do you think? I think it might be in 
like in some games, they'll be a weak against each other and strong against each other. Okay, all right. Like certain moves work better than others kind of thing? Yeah, like they're kind of weak and strong against each other. Depending on what's used. Yeah. It could be interesting. Or if there was some sort of thing like during the day, if you're fighting during the day, the light type is stronger, but during the night, the dark type is stronger. Oh, yeah! Oh yeah, that, would, that could be cool. Day night cycle would be great. Well, no, they, they do. Have, they've had a day night cycle in every Pokemon game since uh, since two, since the second generation. Let's go, in though. Yeah. I don't think. Well, I guess this is a remake of Gen One, which didn't. Have Gen it. One, yeah, yeah. But uh, and in uh, the way, and I think Gwen already knows this, but uh, the way to evolve Espeon or Umbreon is Espeon evolves during the day, and yeah, Umbreon I only know evolves that at night. Mm. I, I know. I, I, I thought. I thought. I thought you would. Yeah. She's keyed in. And uh, if I needed. To get one in Moon, I'll get Omrion because, like, in the daytime in real life, it's night. Oh. And, like, my Omrion will always be strong against light types. <laughs> well, there we go. But if there's, like, someone that has uh, a sun, like, a Pokemon Sun game, I would stay away from them if they had, like, whatever light type. Yeah, that would make sense if you had the dark type. I'll be like, oh, mm. how would I go out here? But if they were holding a big Pokemon tournament, they would have to decide whether it's at daytime or nighttime because they, they it could ruin mm. it could ruin someone's team if they if they were weaker at a different part of the day. It, it, it's it's an interesting idea though. I'm I'm really excited to see what new gameplay stuff we get. But like, what should happen if it's dawn? Like, <laughs> if the sun is setting or the sun is rising? Then they're exactly <laughs> equally strong and weak, just just like the dusk version of Lycanroc and Rock in uh, in Pokemon Sun and Moon, but only Ultra. They just and become Ultra. bounced. Yeah. But that being said, with as you were saying to the point of yeah, how to handle it in the stadium, they could definitely have moves kind of like those ones that make it sunny or whatever that boost characters' yeah. moves or the water, the raining ones. So they could have something where like it mm. oh yeah, darkens the sky to night. Oh yeah, there's a uh, people will design entire teams around a uh, rain dance and sunny day and sandstorm yeah. because those because those effects have a lot of different properties. Yeah, exactly. So I feel like it could have a, a strategy here. Like maybe a sunny day move or like. And then like a dark, a darky night. That's the, <laughs> a gloomy night. It's like a nightfall move or a uh... yeah. gloomy night. That's mm-hmm. a good one. Yeah. yeah, something like that. If like one of the people put gloomy night up, and the other one puts sunny day, you will enter a mini game that's like a rock paper scissors <laughs> for whoever's. Oh wow! Effect stays up. Gwen has Gwen has some bold Pokemon game design ideas. It gets into like a really big meta. It's true. Yeah. Well, she's been talking for years since I've known her about making her own Pokemon games in the future, which we won't go into too deep here. Also, because we don't, you know, OC, don't steal. So <laughs> we'll uh, keep that to ourselves for now. Too late. There's but already I've... a Reddit, there's already a Reddit thread with 200 views. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad she hasn't gotten down that rabbit hole either. Either way, this sounds like it's going to be a really fun time getting into this new generation especially with it on the switch and we've got a lot of exciting news to look forward to in the coming months and yeah who knows we might get gwen back on once we get a bigger update again in the uh, coming months as well there's a lot of enthusiasm around the switch that thing is still selling like hotcakes it's the it's mm-hmm. probably the system people are most excited about right now and pokemon is the most popular entertainment franchise in history by certain measurements so when we get a new generation of pokemon on the switch later this year it is going to be gangbusters um, and i know a lot of people in rpg fan are, are getting that game so i'm very much looking forward to battling and trading all of my comrades on random and retro encounter it's going to be a good time yeah i'm excited to have that already um inborn fan base that i can jump into and be a part of because in the past what always held me off is i just didn't really have anyone to play with so it's going to be fun having that for a solid few months many many people will be playing that thing so if you if you get in relatively early you will not be lacking for pokemon partners mm-hmm but you're going to need the online service in order to trade, right? <laughs> in order to trade non, non-locally, yes. Uh, you, you, um, yeah. uh, the 3DS and DS versions did have local and online trading, but uh, you probably would need Nintendo Online to do, the, uh, to do long-distance trading and battling. Yeah, like Wonder Trade and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Do you have any final th- thoughts, Gwen, before we wrap up conversation on Pokemon? Yeah, so for a game I don't want to make that I want to see Nintendo and Game Freak do, oh. I hope they have a future and past game oh like pokemon future pokemon mm. past yeah that'd be kind of neat and, and like then we get a pokemon future crossover. and pokemon 
past or maybe be like XYZ and add a third one that's like Pokemon present. (laughs) Gotcha. Pokemon past. Yeah. Pokemon future and then yeah. Pokemon present. But out the <laughs> There's a town in Pokemon Black and White that's like an ancient temple town in a white version, and then a futuristic, like uh, almost like Tron-like town in Pokemon Black. So you want a whole game that's like that, one that's like a future and past version of the same place. It'll be cool in the if you go in the past, you'll be able to visit that place where it was like all ruins, and you would see what it will be used to be. Radiant Historia meets Pokemon. I like it. Tales yeah. of sure. Fan Pokemon Tasia. Like, look in the corner. <laughs> wow. <laughs> it's Gen 9. We got, already got that in, in the works now. Well, by that point in time, Gwen could be uh, into game yeah. development, so who the well, heck Well, don't steal my <laughs> idea of Pokemon chocolate and Pokemon vanilla. That's that's what I want. <laughs> Are you sure that's a Pokemon game or just like no, a splat? I, th- I think that that's just, <laughs> no, that, that's just the uh, new um, variations of Vanillux, the ice cream Pokemon. Delicious. <laughs> and do not steal... My two ideas for Pokemon Cloud and Oh, you you, you, you got to stop saying Pokemon ideas because this is a podcast. People are going to steal the people are going to steal the heck out of it in a few days. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's not trademarked anymore. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for coming on, Gwen. It was really nice having you to uh, chat about your your fun ideas. Thank you. Our pleasure. Release the Bye, title. Gwen. Bye, Gwen. Good thanks for thanks night. for joining us. And she's she is so adorable. I, like I did my so. best not to corrupt her to her core in the. 20 minutes of speaking with her. Wait until she's like 10 years older and then then the corruption can... Then be. I will either be 43 or dead. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much both for humoring mm-hmm. all that and I'm glad it went well. So, yeah, Pokemon's going to be definitely something to look forward to ideally by the end of this year, especially if Mike's predictions are true that we'll get it in the fall. But before that, uh, summer's looking pretty nuts as we discussed on the last episode about Nintendo Direct. There's also a lot coming up that wasn't mentioned in Nintendo Direct that uh, Mike was mentioning to us. Yeah, um, I just, uh, I think shortly after the Nintendo Direct, we had uh, just a couple summer announcements in a row that made me realize this is just a unusually packed summer for RPGs. Uh, Just the stuff that we know for sure is coming out are uh, Persona Q2, New Cinema Labyrinth, uh, Judgment, that game by the Yakuza team. Yeah, that looks really interesting. Yeah, Dragon Quest Builders 2, Fire Emblem Three Houses, Final Fantasy XIV Shadowbringers, Shenmue 3, and presumably, uh, let's see, Marvel Ultimate Alliance 3 and Oninaki are both supposed to be summer releases. Uh, Bloodstained Ritual of the Night is supposed to be a a summer release. I think that did get... Oh, I didn't... I didn't realize Oninaki was that far along. Yeah, they, they say they're saying summer. That might be Japan only, but uh, it, it's officially listed as summer in the su- summary of the uh, Nintendo Direct. Huh. Oh, wow. And uh, a couple things that just have unconfirmed 2019 releases, like uh, your Code Veins and uh, Sakuna Rice and Ruins of the world. I but Sakuna is going to be so cute. The two I'm probably looking forward to the most are Persona Q2 and Judgment. Persona Q2 because I am a Persona fanboy and I really liked the first Persona Q, but in a, instead of a school festival gimmick, this has a movie theater gimmick. So each each one of the big labyrinths that you go through is a based on a film genre. I know the uh, I, I don't know what, if it would constitute spoilers or not, so I won't say when it, it, we already know what they all are because they're they've been shown in trailers and the game has been out in Japan for a few months, but. Uh, so it's a, it looks like it's it's similar to Persona Q1. There will be some new characters that are creating a sort of a connected story in which all of the characters from Persona 3, 4, and 5 are uh, summoned to you know to help these uh, these new characters in whatever their goal is. And uh, it's all of the playable characters from 3, 4, and 5, including uh, including the temporary ones, avoiding spoilers in case people haven't played Persona games that are 10 years old. And, it, and they're even bringing back the uh, female protagonist from the PSP version of Persona 3, who's sometimes called the, uh, you know, the Fem-C or the girl protagonist, or sometimes Hamuko, which is a some kind of Japanese pun for, uh, a ma- for a hero's name or something. I don't know exactly how it works. But I'm really looking forward to that, and uh, that comes out on June 4th. Perfect timing for me to take it on the plane to Los Angeles for a game trade show in Los Angeles. And uh, Judgment is uh, really crazy looking. It, it's uh, basically a uh, a disgraced lawyer with sort of uh, with sort of nothing left to lose is um is going around uh, um, Kamurocho, the same fake neighborhood of Tokyo from the Yakuza series. So this might be a shared world with Yakuza. Uh, basically, salt. 
uh, solving mysteries and uncovering corruption in the justice system and basically just being a, a badass lawyer man. And uh, um, there was a famous Japanese uh, live-action drama from around 15 years ago called Hero. And it's one of the most popular Japanese TV shows in history. Uh, he, it's, uh, it's like, it still has like top 10 ratings all time for a, sketch, for a scripted show in Japan. And it was also about a, a bad boy lawyer who was, uh, who was working outside the law and, and, and rule breaking and stuff. And, and the main character of it was an actor named uh, Takuya Kimura, who was a boy band member in the, in the 1990s and is now a, a popular actor. And uh, they brought back Kim- Kimura is the likeness and voice of the main character in Judgment. Oh, cool. Yeah, so it, it's um, like it's sort of low key. People are familiar with Japanese television. We know, like, oh, they're sort of kind of doing a giant hero reference, but with the uh, the action and maybe the tone and dialogue of one of the Sega Yakuza games. And um, and Takuya Kimura again, he's a very he's a very popular ap- actor in Japan, and he's never worked in video games before. So hmm. this is so having him in uh, in this role is a you know a a a, 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 a cool surprise at least. And uh, I've only seen, like, one episode of Hero, because it was uh, recommended to me by someone in the anime club in college, of all things. But it's a, it's, it's a cool show, and that the fact they're, um, they're, you know, sort of recreating some of the ideas in Hero for Judgment, which I think is called Judge Eyes in Japan, is uh, super cool. And I am really, really interested in that game, even though I've barely played any Yakuza games. Well, I'm wondering if the, there will be any sort of crossover stuff where you have to, like, defend any of the yakuza characters yeah cameos yeah i think there will be at least some level of cameo or reference i think they kind of want to they don't want to make this like a, a yakuza gaiden chapter they want it to sort of be its own thing but it is definitely in kamurocho and and uh so there's going to be at least a little bit of that but again uh, i don't think the game is out in japan yet so we don't have anything confirmed uh but i think there was a japanese demo and we know for sure Wait no, I lied. No, it came out in Japan in, uh, a, a few months ago, so it's 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 out there. Um, but it, it's it's so it is it is out in Japan already, and it did very well there. But it comes out in late June uh, worldwide. It's interesting. We've come such a long way now with having so many places to play games these days. Like I can definitely remember being a kid at the summer vacation, and there was just like one or two like big hot releases that you knew everyone wanted to get on and play and just spend the summer diving into. Yeah, but the industry is thriving so much right now, and uh, I mean, it's arguable whether prices and some practices are consumer-friendly, but there's a, and there's there's so many venues and so many uh, scenes and so many sort of like, uh, there's game development at so many multiple levels. There's uh, people making free games on Itch.io and uh, g- and games with budgets of over a billion dollars, which I think is true of Red Dead Redemption 2 and others. So it's like there's games being developed at every size and budget level and ways of obtaining games at uh, multiple levels. And so it's it, like the case of uh, the labor situation in the industry is not is not desirable, but in terms of how many games are being played and how, and all the ways and means of making games and playing games is staggering. And that And that's how we're getting you know, a 2018 and 2019 that are so loaded. Yeah, exactly. And it's, I don't envy kids and their parents having to figure out what exactly they're going to be spending their, their hard earned allowances and, or, you know, wages on to get their kids the latest game and what those one or several games are going to be. I am not raising a child or buying any games for children. And I'm having enough difficulty deciding on like making decisions on what games to not uh, to buy or not to buy. Cause I have to, I mean, I'm, I'm paying off a house and uh, <laughs> and student loans. I have to budget. I have to um, set my budget pretty strictly, and it's not a blast to think that I can definitely afford six to ten games on a year. And suddenly there's twenty that I want. It's like this is this this, this is a problem. Yeah, it's a definitely huge Cadillac problem. But yeah, yeah, it's a it's, a, it's a great problem because the problem is that there are too many video games, and the, and video games are a thing we love. But still, it's a it's it's a little overwhelming at times too many games and if you don't have that self-control it can definitely be crippling oh yeah i've had to i've had to learn self-control over the years i'm I'm still not great at it (laughs) are any of us really Mm. there's always something that's our vice that really drags us down i'm looking at you chocolate you don't want to know how many hours of monster hunter world i played in february of 2018 there's a reason i was not on any podcast that month let me go bust out my uh, ps4 and look at your history yeah let me boot up final fantasy 14 and tell you how many hours i have in the game right it's yeah there's definitely things that we can sink into and it i can also see from a parent's perspective especially and then arguably from a kid's perspective the counter argument is why get the latest thing when there is some great free to play stuff out there that's dragging people in like Fortnite, like apex legends i mean if you're 
specifically going for an RPG game, well then, here you are. That's what you're going to be buying. There's not a lot of free-to-play RPGs that really drag you in as heavily as those experiences do. Drag but... Alia Lost might drag you in. That's the, I just got into it now that it's in Canada, and I was going to say that is one of them that definitely feels like a full-fledged RPG experience. And um, Another Eden is very similar as well as that as well, although I don't feel like the story and characters are as well fleshed out as Dragalia Lost now that I'm playing it, but it still feels like a full, complete RPG experience where you minimally have to buy into. The gacha experience is pretty cheap, if not free, for the entire thing, and the story is robust enough to keep you going like any RPG would. But I can see how people would easily justify away from spending any money on any of these hot titles, which gives developers definitely a lot of competition to make games that you want to spend the money on these days. Yeah, it's 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 an exciting but overwhelming time to be into video games in 2019. There's You have a lot of options. Mm-hmm. And I'll probably just go back to playing Monster Hunter and Heroes of the Storm and what have you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've definitely talked about that. When you have these developers releasing like free updates like uh, Moonlighter and monster hunter worlds continuous free content why play anything else when these games are getting free updates that make you want to keep coming back is there anything you're looking forward to over the summer caitlin whether it's from the nintendo director uh, any of the other stuff that we have talked about uh well i'm looking forward to final fantasy 14 Shadowbringers. get out of town yeah you. no big surprise right <laughs> um, oh and I, I didn't i didn't mention this one before but indivisible should come out by this summer and that's that uh that cool oh yes yeah, side scroller yeah, it's a side-scrolling RPG with combat that looks really similar to Valkyrie Profile. Oh, I have not looked at anything. Oh, about oh, that, the but now I'm intrigued. It is a beautifully animated game that is worth looking at a trailer of for sure. And I think that's that's supposed to be a like May June kind of game, but we don't have an official release of it. I have a feeling I'm just going to be playing stuff that comes out in like March and whatnot. Still, as I try and catch up to my own backlog. Oh, and... tell me about it. My backlog is huge. Right, and yeah, well, I mean, you know, we spent a whole last episode yeah. <laughs> to go talking about 20 I'm still playing God of War, by the to. way. Like, um, I actually don't understand how people beat that game so quickly. I'm only about halfway through, and I've probably sunk like a good 15, 20 hours into it. So. Yeah, no, it's it's a, it's a long game. It's at least 30 hours. It's, it's not like the uh, character action God of War's of the 2000s and it is also way more rpg like and has way more exploration attached to it than other god of war games god god of war is a big meaty triple a action rpg and not i love the hub mike oh my god i love the okay hub. The, uh, i love the lake and then i think i love the world tree in the middle of the lake even more it's than the rest so of the lake. pretty <laughs> it's a it's a really really beautiful transport hub that it, that it's almost a disservice calling it just a transport hub yeah Ugh. I could we could keep talking about it, but we should probably move on so I don't start gabbing about it. Oh, and and uh, in, I, I was I was double checking Indivisible to make sure that I wasn't uh, getting saying something wrong, but it, it still is uncon- unconfirmed 2019 release, and the it, the uh, music is being composed by Hiroki Kikuta of oh. the Mana series. Oh, I forgot about that. So nice. Yeah, so uh, so definitely check out a trailer of that because I am excited for it. Yeah, Valkyrie is one I've definitely passed over, but I wish I hadn't because it always looks really intriguing to me. So if I ever find like an old copy to throw on the PS, I think you can. Go back <laughs> I think you can play Valkyrie Profile on on PS. You can get the PSP version digitally, and you can play it on mobile now. So there, there's it's it was one of the rarest PS1 games, but now that now it's not as hard to find. Oh, okay, that's good to know. I I knew there was a mobile version, but I didn't realize it was that version. I thought it was a different like Gotcha one or something. No, no, it's a uh, it's the original. It's um, but oh, it's a. Nice. Uh, there are ways of playing old rare games now. For myself, for the summer, Dragon Quest Builders 2 is probably what I want to get into the most because the first one looked intriguing and I passed over just because it was getting kind of a general vibe that once they get to the sequel, they'll improve on everything this one established. So I figured why not just wait at that point. So I'm hoping this summer I'll be crafting things in an effort to save the world of Dragon Quest. Yep. Um, and it has a lot of neat story and character elements from Dragon Quest 2 in it which i'm interested to see how it follows up because dragon quest 2 is not one of the better dragon quest games <laughs> but uh well, right and the first one ties into dragon quest 1 so this one they're tying into 2 that's cool. yeah i'm not interested in it because it's dragon quest 2 i'm interested in the way they'll subvert or adapt parts of dragon quest 2 and uh, that's interesting to me as a series fan but uh well yeah it was interesting in the first one just kind of how this the story either it was it was it a prequel or it ran parallel to i can't remember how the first one worked with its connection it's a semi-sequel because at the end of dragon quest one dragon lord asks if you want to join him uh ruling the world or not and you're supposed to say no and then fight him 
but the the, the gimmick of, of Builders One was the hero said yes and ended up being sort of disgraced, and you're a new right, and, you, so and like you're an yeah timeline. yeah and you're a new hero trying to save the world in an alternate timeline. So it's an alternate timeline sequel, and uh, that's neat. And I do not know exactly how it's adapted in Dragon Quest Builders Two because it's uh, not out in English yet, and I haven't done as much research. But I am interested to see what they do because because I know that that. Uh, both Hargon and Malroth slash Shido are involved, but I don't know exactly how. Those those are the main villains of Dragon Quest 2. <laughs> Thank you for clarifying, but I, or I assumed rather. But yeah, I look forward to figuring that one out when we get A, more details, and B, when I just get to dive into it. That'll be the most fun. Just to, It's just such a fun, vibrant world, and a nice having a nice, robust story to kind of back up the, the Minecraft mechanics of it all is more appealing to me than a lot of the time I spent in Minecraft. But yeah, we got a insane summer for stuff to play and i bid you all the best of luck in trying to uh discern what exactly you want to play you could be like derek and have a whole whiteboard and have it all plotted out how you're going to budget and time and money towards getting it i'm not that organized i have my games budget in a spreadsheet not a whiteboard <laughs> i was gonna say i would not put that past you for a second mm. but moving on last week we had a question come in from arclight on the discord channel which we kind of passed over since it was just myself and Caitlin and I felt having even one more other voice would make this discussion a lot more interesting because he asked us uh, a really great question. Uh, he asks, have any of us ever tried to play a specific game multiple times because we knew it was supposedly great, but for one reason or another, we just kept bouncing off of it. So whichever you want to take the stage at answering this really awesome question first, because I'm sure this has plagued many people having the unpopular opinion and uh, not being able to just stick to something that everybody else loves. What do you two think? So I guess, well, first off, bounced off can mean a couple different things. So I guess I'll, I'll, I'll mention two. Bounced off in the sense that I couldn't stick with it, like I couldn't beat it. Would For me, probably my, my greatest shame is Persona 3. And, and you couldn't beat it for what reason? Because I, I kept getting distracted. I kept getting bored and other things would come up and Persona 3... Would not. That game's long as hell at at like six, at seventy plus hours yeah. at least. And it's not it's not that oh, I yeah. disliked it. It's that it would, I guess I would get to a point where I, it would lose my interest, and it would partly be the game, but it would also partly be because there was always something else coming up that was more interesting to me, and so I would gradually drop it and then just never get back to it. So I do eventually want to play the entire game but every time i try i inevitably get midway through it and then find myself kind of you know eh. and i mean i've done that i i first played fes did that i i have uh the p3p same thing there um so it's like you know i've tried it multiple times are you someone who has to start from scratch every time or like can you um, maybe just like you know keep a journal and then make notes and then come back to it when you're ready if it's been a long enough time between attempts to play through i would start over again i don't i'm i'm weird in that i i want to like refresh my memory when i haven't played a game for a week let alone a year so i think that's so, fair yeah it, it would be hard for me to pick up a, a playthrough right in the middle of where i left it off and feel like feel like I was it feel like it was part of the same playthrough it almost feel like I had just started this game in the middle for the first time and not done any of the previous stuff so mm, fair enough and what was the second one you were talking So the about? other sense of the word bounced off to me is that you played it but you completely hated it and could not find anything redeeming about it whatsoever like I just completely bounced off of Final Fantasy 15 because my hatred for that game is well known and I won't get into it of course because I've talked about it a lot but that's a RPG game RPG fans game of the year 2016 I know oh it's I I but not forever <laughs> say that Cold Steel 2 was robbed so this is this is almost as much of a reaction as uh bringing up the Witcher uh Witcher 2 Dark Souls argument to Rob Steinman uh. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy but hey, we got Dark Souls on the podcast now. Oh damn it! Uh, so, someone <laughs> just won that? their game of retro, of a uh, random encounter bingo. Exactly. It's been a while. We've managed to to dodge it somehow. Even though I keep wanting to do it just in his name, but I just never get up to it. Uh, why is it that you just hated it, Caitlin? Well, Final Fantasy fifteen. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm, just, I'm leading you. I, we like you said. We know yes. why. I was going to say if you could sum it up into one word, what would it be? 
Misogyny? That's a big part of it, but plot holes. That That is Fair. one, I think it's one, or is it two? Well. I'll, either way, I'll allow it. Because I agree, that's definitely it, it's 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 a it's a single things. concept, even if it's two words. Yeah, I buy that. Mike, how about yourself? What uh, what game are you? Do you just not like I said? Uh, you don't you bounced off it because it was too much for you, or couldn't get into it, or whatever. Um, I'll I'll use Caitlin's interpretation of the question. Whereas, so the for one interpretation, a game that I just hated from the beginning and could not get into, no matter how uh, just. I, that I did make an honest effort to try, but just did not like at all, is I'm going to go about 30 years earlier than Caitlyn's guess and say Zelda 2. Ooh. Because I didn't, I didn't play Zelda 2 until the 90s, because I, uh, I was born in the mid 80s and was playing video games mostly in the 90s, and so I had, I think I had already played Zelda 1 and uh, Link's Awakening, and liked both of those a lot, and Zelda 2 was didn't play like either of them, and instead played like almost like a worse Castlevania game. Where, where that was that was yeah. a side scrolling you side scrolled through uh, temple and swamp and forest areas with gameplay that just did not seem as tight or as fun or as varied as uh, top down Zelda or side scrolling Castlevania or even side scrolling Mario or Ninja Gaiden. So I I liked a lot of NES, NES games. I liked Zelda, but I I just could not get into Zelda 2. I think I rented it once or twice and that was it. I always thought that was the black sheep that no one really liked. Yeah, that, that's fair. But I mean, it, but you want to talk about a game that I tried and then just bounced off of, that's the answer. <laughs> um, it, totally I, I, if fair. anything, I thought it was more deserving of a remake than uh, Link's Awakening because uh, Link's Awakening, there's much less broke about Link's Awakening than this is Zelda 2. Zelda 2 is a game that needs a lot of help and I, and I think Link's Awakening holds up. I even played it for uh, Retro Encounters Zelda month last year. But uh, the the uh, yeah, the other answer is a game that is popular that I have tried multiple times from the beginning, and uh, just could not get into. And this is even multiple versions of the same game. And that's uh, Breath of Fire three for the PlayStation. I ha- really? I have a PS one copy of that game, and I have a PSP down uh, version of that game that I that I bought in the UK because I don't think that PSP version came out in North America. Uh, and I like I've beaten uh, Breath of Fire two and Breath of Fire four, and I liked both of those a lot. And I wanted to get into Breath of Fire 3 because I was a Cap, I was and still am a Capcom fanboy uh, who was playing Devil May Cry 5 a number of hours ago even, and I and I really like the the sort of the style and look and vibe of the Breath of Fire games. Yeah, it, they're very cartoony, a little pastel, but with a bunch of cool dragons and animal people and big dramatic stories. So it's like I should like the entire Breath of Fire series, and three is one of the most popular ones, but I. I've tried to play that thing at least four times, and I give up. I think I usually give up in the big mansion that you go to in the beginning of the game. Right, the the robbery. Right? Yeah, exactly. But and uh, but once I did get far enough to meet Nina, and I gave up in the, when you're sort of escaping a dungeon with Nina. I think. Yeah, I think. I yeah, yeah, that's up. the farthest I've gotten. But so yeah, my answer, my real answer to this query is Breath of Fire three. Oh, it's unfortunate. It's one of my faves, and it's the first, actually, Breath of Fire I ever played in the series, and what got me to go back and try out one and two, which I haven't beat yet, but I like. Yeah, them. I played two was the one that got me into it, and then I tried uh, playing Breath of Fire three a bunch of times and couldn't, and I couldn't find a copy of Breath of Fire four because it was sort of rare, and ended up beating Breath of Fire four much, much later, just only a year or two ago. But uh, but I do want to try that one out. Yeah. Too. So and the, I I beat Breath of Fire four on using a the uh, excuse me the PS one version on Vita is how I played that thing but yeah breath of fire 3 is the one that i couldn't get far very far into for myself i would go with disgaea like most games i enjoy and i if i don't like it i usually have found out before i take the time and the money to invest but disguise i'd heard so much good stuff about as a strategy rpg lover i thought i would in find it endearing i like the art style so i got into that game and i do love the kind of depth it has for building stats. And we've talked about it a bit before, and I've definitely heard you go into greater detail about it on retro. Oh boy. Do I like, do I like this guy? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Exactly. But I just couldn't get it. Like I just was, I don't know the, the, the the very anime tropey storyline, which had its moments just got really grating on me. Like the characters I didn't find really grabbed me in to make me want to grind through its very grindy combat. And I just was like, I don't have time for this. I'm not enjoying the story. It's pretty enough. It plays really nicely, but just, nope, not for me. I don't like it, and I eventually sold it off. And I just, I always kind of felt sort of bad, because, again, I know there's a lot of hardcore JRPG fans who absolutely love it, and 
as someone who sort of counted myself amongst that, I was like, oh, what's wrong with me? Yeah, there, are, there are six or seven main series Disgaea games, and I've beaten five of them. <laughs> uh, and I, I have, I have almost impulse bought Disgaea Five on Switch before, which is one of the ones I haven't played. But yeah, it's it's a weird, exploitative, over the top version of strategy RPG combat, and I think, and as they they have surprisingly good story and characters. Mostly, I say mostly because that does not apply to all the Disgaea games, one hundred percent for sure. But I, I don't know, man. It it really does do it for me. And it, the thing is, even when you gr- even when you're encouraged to grind. It's like they'll give you maps just for that. That just give you a quick grind, a quick seven levels, uh, if you if you uh, if you use the right strategy for them. And I uh, and right. and uh, again, like you can level up to level ten thousand minus one and jump in and level up your items and level up your and uh, stats and level up all the enemies around you and then beat up uh, uh, beat up a, a judge or a jury full of demons to change the rules of the game and all kinds of silly stuff. But the final boss of the game is usually in the level 70 to 90 range, so you don't really have to do any of that. No, and that's fair. And it, it's But as someone like myself who is more of a completionist-type person, oh, then, then forget the, the it. fact Be- that I can do it makes me want to do it, and then I was just like, oh, that's oh, yeah. so much minutiae that's so neat, but at the same time, it's oh, so oh, consuming. Oh, boy, good effing luck. If you want to do everything in a Disgaea game, don't play any other games <laughs> for two months. Oh. Yeah, exactly. I, I've, o- I've only gone like. really deep into the end game of Disgaea one and two, and uh, but after that, it's like you know what? I like Disgaea three and four a lot, especially four. Four, my I think four is one of the best in the series, but I I do not have the stamina to 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 fight the whatever version of Bale that I'm fighting this time. Uh, so it, it's I mean you, you you can get a lot out of a Disgaea game by d- diving in, but. I would recommend against going for the completionist instinct unless you're totally invested because there's so it's so so much in every Disgaea game. The the one the only one I've broken, I've broken a hundred hours on the PSP version of one, and that's probably it. Yeah, there's a lot there's a lot to do, and I've definitely had plenty of RPGs where I have broken a hundred hours on, but that was just not one that uh, called to me to do it. But yeah, thank you, Ark. Like that was a like I said a great question, and I was really happy to get into this discussion. And I do love the fact that I think every one of us had a game that one other of us has played and actually liked, and that everyone else was not on board for. If anyone listening wants to tell us your games that you've bounced off on Twitter or uh, on the old Discord, please hit us up for that. But yeah, after that great question, we are I'd say at an end of this episode because we have chit chatted a lot, <laughs> my friends. So. If you do want to uh, leave any feedback on the episode, you can find us on our Discord. You can also find us on Twitter at RPGFanCom. You can leave us any comments, complaints, love, hate, whatever you need to share with us. Or if you just want to send us some spare potions, hit us up at podcast at RPGFan.com. And finally, we have other podcasts. Did you know that? Did you, Mike, did you know that we have other podcasts? You know, I, yeah, I think I did. Yeah, I think one of them uh, might be a, a little something you know called Retro Encounter. How about you tell us about that, Mike? What's happening over there? Sure. Uh, Retro Encounter is RPG fans' weekly podcast with uh, new topics every week. And uh, I don't know exactly when this episode is airing, but they're in the rest of March we have two episodes on Lufia 2, Rise of the Sinistrals, and one episode on Kingdom Hearts 3, uh, a special spoiler cast uh, upcoming. And then I have planned out parts of april and may but i'm not prepared to talk about them yet so yeah please check out rpg fans retro encounter if you have a mind to listeners yeah whatever is on the board coming months whether uh, it's revealed or not you know there's going to be some good conversation yeah talk well uh, let's see i, I mean uh, uh, there are going to be two episodes of east the oath and felgana in april i can say that but beyond but beyond that i cannot say anything else right that's right you're all playing some east right now which i was hoping I could jump on, but I just didn't. Yeah, I haven't started it yet. It's not a very long game. It's only about 12 or 15 hours. So my my goal is to start that immediately after finishing Devil May Cry 5. But uh, but those are episodes aren't going up until April, so I still have some time. You got time, for sure. Yeah. The other podcast we have, which hasn't had a new episode in quite some time, and we're all still hoping that we'll find the time to breathe new life into it, is Rhythm Encounter. If you like music from RPGs, past and present, check out that uh lovely podcast caitlin was definitely a host and helmed that for a long time and brought some great music to our ears once upon a time (laughs) and hopefully that time will come once again but no promises i'm sorry either way thank you so much everyone for listening uh for myself for caitlin for mike thank you so much and we'll catch you on the next episode